Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call tonight's meeting to order, 6 o'clock, and we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance, led by Councilmember Armendariz. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and I, do we have an invocation tonight? I don't no. no, Madam Mayor. All right. Everyone can be seated. Thank you. All right. City Clerk's report on posting the agenda and roll call. Yes, Madam Mayor. The agenda was posted on Thursday, June 15th at 1.17 p.m. Councilmember Armadares? Here. Councilmember Brocker? Here. Councilmember Klein? Here. Councilmember Hilton is absent? Councilmember Marks? Here. Councilmember Tovar? Here. And Mayor Blankley? Here. All right. Under <coughs> orders of the day, we have none. Under employee introductions, Chief Police Chief Espinoza will be uh, presenting two promotions. Yes? Okay. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council, and members of the community, I'm happy to share and celebrate the promotion of our two of our newest supervisors. And we'll start off with Sergeant Jesus Cortez. He has approximately 25 years of experience. Prior to working for the city of Gilroy, he was employed with both the Hollister and Watsonville Police Departments. He's held the assignments of school resource officer, dare instructor, gang investigator, mountain enforcement unit officer, bike patrol, field training officer, uh, recently as a corporal, and also a corporal in the detective unit. In his spare time, he enjoys coaching football here locally and any other youth sports that uh, his kids participate in. Please help me congratulate Sergeant Jesus Cortez. <laughs> Put me on the spot, right? <laughs> no, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm grateful, um, thankful to Chief Espinosa, the command staff. Um, this is something I've been wanting to do. It's been my dream um, for a long, long time. So it finally happened. Um, I'm honored. Um, Proud to represent the uh, Gilroy Police Department in the city of Gilroy. I live in the city. Um, I take a lot of honor in representing uh, my community. Hence, uh, you know, I'm involved in youth sports, and I'd like to be a positive role model. Um, again, uh, I want to thank uh, Council, Chief, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have Corporal Chris Silva, and he was promoted on the 6th. Of June. Corporal Silva grew up in San Luis Obispo, and where he met his wife, Caitlin, and I think she's here in the, in the crowd. Uh, the two have lived in Gilroy since 2008, where they are raising their three children. Corporal Silva is a 15 year law enforcement veteran and has been with the Gilroy Police Department since 2015. Corporal Silva previously worked for the Salinas Police Department. Uh, where he distinguished himself by receiving several commendations to include the Medal of Valor, Stolen Vehicle Recovery Award, DUI Suppression Award, and Domestic Violence Advocacy Award. Spurred by a strong sense of duty to the community where he lives, he lateraled here to the city of Gilroy in 2015 and has been a member uh, of the department uh, both as a field training officer uh, a corporal, a major accident investigation team member, a hostage negotiator team member, and was recently the robbery homicide detective uh, here uh, in the investigation units. Please help me congratulate Christopher Silva as a newest corporal. Uh, Chief Espinoza, command staff, thank you for this opportunity uh, to the city staff. Madam Mayor and Council Members, thank you for this opportunity. I greatly appreciate it. And to my wife and family for being here, um, by which I wouldn't be able to, to do what I do. Um, I take a lot of pride and you know, professionalism in doing this job, especially in the town where I live, and I've called home for over 15 years now, um, just like Sergeant Cortez, who I uh, can credit as one of the people that inspired me to come work here. So I just want to say thank you for this opportunity, and I strive to do my best to seek righteousness, justice, and mercy for this city. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to both of you. Okay, Bryce, all right, you have someone to introduce? Yep, thank you. 
Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I am pleased to introduce Daniel Scott to you as the city's new Community Resilience Coordinator. Uh, Daniel brings to the city over 20 years of experience in the emergency management field, including government agencies and institutions of higher education. Uh, Daniel possesses a master's degree in leadership and organizational development and a bachelor's in social welfare, well, social, social welfare uh, both from Fresno Pacific University, along with an associate's degree in emergency management, and is also pursuing a doctorate in public policy with a focus on national security. Uh, Daniel is also a certified emergency manager through the International Association of Emergency Managers. Daniel uses his experience, education abilities to help implement Gilroy's community resilience uh, vision and deliver education training to the general public in comprehensive emergency preparedness and mitigating disasters. Please join us in welcoming Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, very excited about the opportunity um, and even more so excited about the project and what it's going to do for the community. So thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. All right, that brings us to item two, ceremonial, ceremonial items, of which we have none. And item three is presentations to the council on items not on the agenda, but within our subject matter jurisdiction. I see five speakers, is that correct? Yes, Madam Mayor. The okay. first speaker is Ron Kirkish, followed by Michelle Campbell, followed by Sharon Luna. Okay, if you were called, can you please come sit in the front row? Thank you. Or if you know you're about to speak, if you're one of the five. Thank you. Go Good ahead. evening, Mayor, community, and City Council. Um, as you notice, today we see another vacant chair. This chair has been vacant quite often in this community. In uh, 2021-2022, the same individual missed 13 meetings, a total of 22% of the meetings. Last April 3rd, the same individual missed a meeting, and tonight he's missing a meeting. When we appoint different people to our commissions, there's a rule that they cannot miss more than three meetings. This individual has a much more important position than a commissioner, city commissioner. He's an elected official, and he should be attending more meetings. When you look at the comparisons between yourselves and his meetings, in 2021, Mayor Blankley missed zero meetings. Councilman Bracco missed zero meetings. Carol Marks missed three, excuse me, two, two meetings. Mr. Tovar, you missed two meetings. Ms. Armendariz missed six. And those were extenuating circumstances, I believe. In this matter, Mr. Hilton missed 13. This is not acceptable, especially when you expect your commissioners to only miss three or less. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Michelle Campbell. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. On a positive note, I wanted to just um, share with you, I sit on the downtown board, for those of you that don't know that. Um, I wanted to share with you the results from our Wine and Art Walk. We had a huge success this year. We had 450 tickets sold. We had 26 poor stations at our local businesses. We had 25 wineries, one port at two stations, all local, most from Gilroy and Morgan Hill, and a few from Hollister, Watsonville, and SoCal. We had 40 artists and artisan vendors, mostly local. However, some came as far away as Los Angeles and Santa Rosa. We had 11 food bite stops at our local restaurants. We had six bands, two in the morning and four in the afternoon. The wine went from one to five, and the art went from 10 to five. Uh, we had feedback. We did a survey to all of our attendees, our volunteers, and our vendors, the art artists. And our feedback was, here's some of the comments. Tasty wine and opened eyes to people that downtown is becoming a destination. Everyone we met is warm and welcoming, and your town is charming in every way. This year's demographics has changed for the better. Great wine and entertainment. My best event of the year. Loved the road closure, good vibes, and swag. Myself and everyone I talked to thought the event was great. Everything ran smoothly, great crowd, well organized. It was way better than Morgan Hills. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I just we just want to thank you guys for thank the city of Gilroy for supporting us in many ways, especially Jimmy Forbes for his guidance and support early on. Thanks to Carol Marks and Fred Tovar for helping during the event, and thanks to Tom Klein for setup and helping with logistics, shuffling wine around. We appreciate all your help and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Sharon Luna. Good evening, Mayor Blakely and City Council members. My name is Sharon Luna, and on behalf of the San Martin Neighborhood Association, SMNA, I would like to invite you all and the citizens of Gilroy to San Martin Town Hall meeting that will take place on June 29th um, at 6.30, and it's at the San Martin Lions Club. The main topic is lead in our environment and information on the $16 million paint settlement that is to pay for homes to be repainted should they have been um, painted with lead paint, base paint. It is important to note that with lead being removed from the planes that land in San Martin Airport and also at Reed Hillview Airports, we must focus on areas that are high on lead. Did you know that Gilroy is higher than Reed Hillview Airport area? They are not even, you are not even close to the airport. San Martin has been dealing with this lead issue for some time. But we've done our research, and we found that there is more of a story to tell. San Martin reached out to the South County to be included, not excluded. Supervisor Arenas is doing an excellent job to include the South County, but there is still work to be done. I thank um, Mayor Blakely, Blankley and um, Mr. Hilton for replying to my email, and I hope that uh, the other council members will get this message out to the residents of their community. Lead is an issue. Lead is important that we don't have it in our bodies and as much as possible in our environment. We are trying to take steps to reduce lead and awareness for all citizens because Gilroy, Morgan Hill, and San Martin are all one. We are all neighbors and we should be supportive. And I hope that you will attend this meeting on June 29th at the San Martin Lions Club. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it'll also be in Spanish and in English. Okay, thanks. All right, Robert Sapita. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Robert Cepeda. Today I would like to address the City Council about the decay of the United States. It has been said that, quote, freedom is not the right to do what we want, but what we ought. Abraham Lincoln. One of my favorite presidents. We currently face a division unforeseen in the history of our country. There is so much uncertainty that we will abide by anything and anyone who may bring us some conformity in our understanding of truth. In 2016, I voted for Hillary Clinton. I was looking forward to having the first female president. I never questioned her policies and past faults. To this, to this day, she has never been punished of her crimes and uses them for political popularity. But her emails, quote unquote, written on a hat that she promotes. She is mocking those that knew about her corruption and glorifying the errors done by her campaign. I voted for Gavin Newsom in 2018, simply because I didn't know anything about his opponent. I also voted for him in 2021 during the recall because I believe the media when he said, quote, when they said, quote, Larry Elder is a white supremacist, unquote, even though he is African American. I told, I'm sorry, I voted for Joe Biden in 2020 because Barack Obama endorsed him, and I didn't want to vote for Donald Trump. I didn't vote for Biden, I voted against Trump. Earlier this month, former President Donald Trump was indicted on federal charges for mishandling classified documents. The current federal prosecution is under the Biden administration. A political rival is arresting his leading opponent on crimes that the current president has done as vice president. Only a sitting president has the authority to declassify documents, which Joe Biden did not have the right to do. It doesn't matter if you vote Democrat, Independent, or Republican. 
This indictment on Donald Trump is a political prosecution. It is backwards on all levels and has officially placed the United States as a banana republic. I once had Trump derangement syndrome, but not anymore. I prefer other candidates for president like Vivek Ramaswamy and RFK Jr. However, Donald Trump has my support as well. You can label me a MAGA extremist, even though my past shows that I have always been a default Democrat. My views have changed for the better, and though I strongly prefer local government over federal, Donald Trump deserves to be the next president. He is not perfect and has made many mistakes and continue, will continue to, yet there is one thing I do believe. He cares about the United States of America and everyone in it, and I do too. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, Christian Madragon. Hello, you guys. My name is Christian Mondragon. So I work downtown Gilroy. I work at Frank's Barbershop. It is a family barbershop. We've been in business for 50 years. I think I'm pretty part of the community. Born and raised in Gilroy. Just give you guys a little background about myself. Um, went to Gilroy High. I was prom king. Um, I don't know. I'm just throwing things out there. But, um, yeah, man, I'm looking for change. I'm looking to make this community a better community. Strong community, um, get rid of every negativity we have, say to positivity, make our people stronger, maybe like with gangs, drugs. I have like, it goes on, but it's my first day here, so I'm trying to break myself in, but many more days to come. Um, let me see. Yeah, my year two when I was prom king, nothing crazy, but we were all positive, everything was going good, we all had a good year, and I'm trying to make this generation. This is Gilroy, the best town we can, we can make, I could possibly make it and we could possibly make it. Because like um, what, what some, la uh, some lady said earlier, we're all neighbors, we're all brothers and sisters, we're all family here. So I think we've got to be on board together and see what happens. But I know where I'm aiming for and I know the, it, the change is coming for the better and it's possible. And I'm not going to stop till I get the results that we want. Thank you. Okay, Wes White. Okay, again, if you're speaking, could you please come to the front row? Thank you. Okay, um, Wes Wyatt, Salinas uh, resident. Just wanted to um, advocate for something I don't usually, but um, LGBT. Uh, I had a chance to go to Fresno last week, and there was about 50 folks that actually spoke up about having a community liaison with the city, an actual paid staff member, um, because there are definitely a lot of... Uh, marginalized groups that, that, that need a lot of uh, support and attention and, and extra special care. Um, you know, and, and one of the reasons that 50 people showed up is because just like in uh, Watsonville at Cabrillo College, um, somebody lit a, uh, a flag on fire at a church. So, um, you know, there, there is quite a bit of um, dangerous ideas and actions that need to be um, protected against, you know. Um, and, and it's just kind of sad that, that between human beings, uh, we, we just can't come together and realize that, that, that we're all one, you know. Um, whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you want to be, um, you know, it's supposed to be a land of the free, home of the brave, um, you know, with liberty and justice for all, but only for as long as you can afford it. And actually, there are a lot of people who were formerly homeless uh, who are also LGBT and some are trans and it just seems to be, you know, the, the compassion of uh, wealth inequality. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be generous if we're a Christian nation, then we're generous. We worry about the Beatitudes. Uh, and, and yet, it, where is it? I mean, the church should be a front line as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the city should be able to support that, you know, without a separation of church and state, of course. Uh, but, you know, there's, it's just a camaraderie of people because the politics always happens with or without a church. Nonprofit is the only thing. And as long as we don't say it on stage or put it on writing, but if we think it, believe it, and still try to make it happen, um, you know, what is the real intention behind that? And that's, you know, money, always. So who, which master do we really serve? We should be serving people and the public and people we don't even know. We need to be meeting people more than halfway every time. Every instance, every, every chance is an opportunity to be the light of Jesus. And we should be taking advantage of that fact and sharing everything we have, turning the other cheek. 
Second Amendment is one of the funniest things about it because the meek shall inherit the earth. Yet we, we have a lot of very deep-rooted ideas in the church and, and in the public. And it's, it's just a bully mentality. And I'm, I'm just really sad that that's the state of our culture throughout. I mean, this isn't the only jurisdiction. You guys, you know, you, there's so many people that get paid so much. And we talk about righteousness. We talk about truth and justice, especially when you get paid so much. And you're so well secured. But what about everyone else? And when is that going to matter more than your job? All right, Todd, Todd Langdon. Is there, I have another speaker after that, too, Robert Aguirre, but no one's up in the front. Okay, please. Thank you. My name is Todd Langton. I'm not a citizen, citizen of uh, the Gilroy. I just moved to Hollister from San Jose. I run a nonprofit called Agape Silicon Valley. We're all a bunch of volunteers who go out and serve the homeless. And our philosophy and our approach is to enhance the standard of living of the unhoused. And there's a mis big, huge misperception and and unfounded myths about the homelessness. From my understanding, from my perspective, and I go out there regularly, weekly, there's a lot of good people out there. And we know that what happens when drugs and alcohol can cause a, a good person to make foolish mistakes. But most of the individuals that are homeless are very good people. They need our helping hand. When you abate them, when you sweep them and move them from one neighborhood to the, to the next, it just causes more problems, more stress, more anxiety, more depression, and they make more, more frequent foolish decisions. I urge you to discard this vote that you're, that's coming up to, to ban them from, uh, from places. So, sir, if you want to comment on something that's on the agenda, then you should wait till we get there. This is for okay. items not on the agenda. Okay. Okay. So, well, let me just keep going. I, I will not, okay, I'll just talk generally, though. This is for items not on the agenda. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking an item that's not on the agenda, and that is we need to show more compassion okay. for our unhoused. They are your neighbors, your friends, and some of your, your family members. And I hope that we all wake up to serving our unhoused the way that we should. There's a better way to do it than sweeping and abating them. Thank you. Okay, Robert Aguirre. Yeah, Robert Aguirre here. Um, playing on some of the things that were said earlier, uh, I do want to uh, point out that uh, Reed Hillview is being considered to be closed in uh, San Jose, it's another county airport, and uh, we had the same concerns up there with the uh, amount of lead that was being used by uh, the planes that were taken off and landing, especially when they just touch and go. Um, and so we actually forced them to uh, change over to unleaded gas and that's something you guys could do down here as well so you can try to uh, minimize the effect of uh, lead on your citizenry and I think that's something you should look into uh, also uh, having to do with what was going on with the um, so that, that is that's not within our jurisdiction, the San Martin Airport. So I just want you to know this is for items not on the agenda, but within our jurisdiction. You can keep going, but I'm just letting you know okay. that anything San Martin Airport is not the city of Gilroy's jurisdiction. Right. Well, somebody earlier was speaking on it. That's why I'm just responding. She to was you. making an announcement. Okay. Well, she was uh, inviting people it. to attend an event. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, being part of the county is something that you know, you might want to do, approach that way as appealing to the county. Anyway, so uh, to the unhoused issue, um, again, I'd like to say that the people that are unhoused are typically victims. They're victims of many different things that cause them to get into this situation. It's not a choice that uh, people make. Most people have difficulty getting out of that situation once they're in it. It's a downward spiral, and so many things can drag, drag you down. Something as little as a $400 debt can actually force people into being unhoused. Um, uh, an illness, whether it's you or, or a family member, um, not having a steady job or not being paid enough to be able to pay the rent, having to make a choice between food or paying rent, or any, any other number of things that can happen. If you're living in your car and all of a sudden you have car trouble and you can't afford that, 
you end up being out in the street, your car gets towed, and you lose everything that you have. And I know because I've had the same situation. I've lived through this, and I know what goes on out in the streets because I do also go out and talk to people throughout the entire county. I'm involved with the uh, California uh, Homeless Union as well as the National Homeless Union, and so I'm aware of things that are going on not just in Gilroy, not just in Santa Clara County, not just in the state of California, but all across the country. And I've also attended many different meetings with the uh, United Nations on poverty, and uh, the study that's been done there showing how the way we treat people out here in, in the United States is appalling, that most other countries do not have such an issue because they take care of their people. And I think we should take up that same attitude and, and try to take care of people as well. And uh, not just be kicking them to the curb and kicking them out and tell them you can't be here, you, you know, just go somewhere else. We don't care where you go, just not here. And when they get there, they get kicked around again. It happens over and over and Thank again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that can, right, no other speakers? Thank yes, you. Madam Mayor. Moving on to item four, reports of council members. Council member Bracco. Nothing report. Council member Armendariz. Uh, no report. Council member Marks. Yes, I have two items. The downtown committee met for the second time this past Tuesday morning. Everyone signed up for a subcommittee to work on with a council person. The subcommittees uh, that are being, ta uh, the subcommittees are tackling the topics of noise, Beautification, plywood removal, vacant buildings, and code enforcement. And this all has to do with the downtown area. The Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency Governing Board met this past Thursday, but since it did not have a quorum, only informational items were heard. The annual report for projects in 2021 and 2022 were presented. 31 projects were covered, with most involving private development. A few of the projects covered were Habitat Restoration, Valley Water Singleton Road Bridge was built over Coyote Creek, Coyote Creek to improve the movement of turtles and fish, completed restoration projects, Calero Pond and Wetland, San Felipe Creek and Coyote Ridge Ponds Restoration, Pacheco Repairing and Planting Project, Pacheco Creek Restoration Project and the Pajaro River Restoration Project. Nearly 11,000 acres are in the reserve system that is protected. Most of this acreage protects aquatic movement. And that's it. Thank you. Council Member Hilton is absent. Council Member Klein. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about two quick things. I know this past weekend we had the uh, car show downtown, and it was, I, I'd just like to say, with the changes we had within um, um, our uh, Chamber of Commerce with Victoria taking over, uh, she did such a great job. The whole staff put together a great show. Uh, there were so many people downtown. It was it, it was a ce celebration of Gilroy and who we are as a community. It was it was fun to be a part of and to just hang out the whole day. One of the other great parts about it was the fact the garlic festival was there as a vendor, and they came up with this great dish. I mean, it is was a great dish. The, the garlic fries a with a dish. pepper steak <laughs> chopped up with a great aioli sauce. They did, they just tore it up. So I just wanted to say, guys, you did a great job. Keep it going. Thanks, Council Member Tovar. Wow, how do you beat that, right? I know. So, so, <laughs> I, no, no, so I have a few things. So first of all, obviously, I want to acknowledge and celebrate to Juneteenth today. So I want to. You know, I had a chance to go to an event, so I want to just celebrate that day today. Um, as uh, many of us on council um, had an opportunity to attend the um, car show this weekend, and again, I also want to th commend uh, Victoria and all the staff at the chamber and uh, for a job well done. It was, I mean, incredible day, so I want to commend them. And obviously, we had our downtown live and GWA, great job. Obviously, you guys, um, large crowd, so I mean, I, I heard a lot of great things about that. Uh, a few of us also had an opportunity to go over to uh, Gallery 1202, the Flaming Hot Art Art Show exhibit um, by Ruben Dario. Uh, it was such a wonderful event to see so many people there celebrating art and also um, in downtown, so I want to commend everybody for that. Um, we had a, our Scrawl meeting, and uh, Mr. Brock was our new vice chair for Scrawl. Uh, Councilmember Renee Spring is our new chair from uh, Morgan Hill. And then finally, had an opportunity to go to um, uh, police officer John Ballard's uh, retirement after 27 years. So I want to congratulate him again and um, acknowledge the great work he's done here, and uh, he'll be missed. That's it. 
All right, thank you. Okay, as shown on our agenda, we will be adjourning uh, in celebration of Juneteenth. Just to make sure everybody realizes that. Okay, we had a VTA board meeting, a special meeting on June 16th. Um, the big discussion is BART Phase Two construction through San Jose. So that's happening now. The Caltrain survey is still going. I can't publicize enough. If you haven't taken the survey for the timing of the fourth train that we're going to get, the fourth commuter train starting in September, please spread the word. Use all of your own social media, your own networks. Get as many people as possible in the South County area to fill out that survey. Caltrain com slash South County Survey. It's about 15 or 16 questions, and that depends on how you answer certain questions. So, um, but this is our chance. This is the time we're getting a train. This is the time to voice what you would need in order to commute using a train, and um, that's when they need to hear from you. Um, as Councilmember Tovar said, we had a uh, sewer treatment plant meeting on on June 7th, and I just thought it was funny that uh, a big part of our discussion was how bad it was driving on Luchessa to get there. We know, right? So for everybody who complains about Luchessa, we know. And as soon as Valley Water is done, that street is going to be repaired. All right. That is my report. Uh, moving on to council correspondence. We have none. Uh, future council initiated agenda items. Seeing none. All right, board and commission interviews. Interviews for open seats on boards and commissions and committees with terms expired or vacant as of June 19th, 2023, uh, for future appointment on July 10th. So tonight is just the interviews. Ty, do you have a report that you want to give? Just a minor uh, presentation that we have two applications that came after the June 9th deadline. So council will need to uh, accept those two out late applications and then let's proceed with the interview process. Okay. Would anyone like to make a, do we need Some a motion? Votes. Okay. No, no motion is just, uh, just thumbs a, up. Just thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. So those have been accepted. So we have four applicants for planning commission, one applicant for parks and rec, one for personnel. And I want the public to realize these are just to fulfill through December 31, 2023. It's another six months on planning. Same on parks and rec. Um, it is longer on personnel. So let's start the interview process. Okay. So since there are only four, can I ask all four to come up uh, to the front, front row? We can maybe just do this from here. So there are two. So Terrence and Stephanie, am I getting that right? Who's here? Okay, so Courtney Hodge is not here then? I did not get here. Okay, and Danny Molina is not here. Correct. Okay. Well, with only two then, why don't we just go to the, to the podium, each of you one at a time. Um, yeah, Terrence, that's fine. You're applying for a planning commission, but you already sit on Parks and Rec and, and OGO, so you want to go ahead and explain your plan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as some of you may know, I originally applied for a planning commission some months back uh, and was selected for the Open Government Commission and subsequently uh, also the Parks and Recreation Commission, which has been great. And uh, just so you know, I have perfect attendance. Well, there you go. So uh, it, the, uh, those have been going great. But uh, my, you know, my long-term goal is to really serve Gilroy, especially in the planning commission. I, I was just reviewing today again because I have before the uh, the 2040 general plan and looked at the the vision, and it's I, I love the city so much. And then when I read this vision, it just says everything. I just have to repeat it even for everybody. In 2040, Gilroy is a diverse and culturally rich community with a small town feel. Gilroy's economy is thriving with a healthy business environment and ample job opportunities for residents. Visitors come to Gilroy for its winery, shopping, festivals, and recreational opportunities. It's well known throughout the region for its excellent schools, agriculture, and downtown. And uh, I want to be carried out of Gilroy feet first. And uh, I want to be involved, now that I have the time to be involved, to help uh, you know, hit that vision. And being on the Planning Commission, I think, helps do that with the experience that I have and got my feet wet in the others. And uh, should it be required, uh, I've got tons of time, but, uh, you know, I would uh, relinquish uh, one or two of those other commissions in order to, to take this on. And, uh, yeah, and, and do the best job I possibly can. Okay. Thank you. All right, council members, um, is there a question? We only have two applicants, so there's time if anybody has something burning to ask. 
I think you just answered it, Terrence, but of the three commissions, which would you prefer? So planning commission, for sure, has, uh, has always been a desire with, again, its connection into all of the things that I think matter in Gilroy. Um, I really did not expect to, uh, to know that the open government uh, commission would be so interesting. It is, and it does only require uh, four meetings a year. So that one's not too onerous, but definitely the planning commission um, is, is where I'd like to be. Okay, I think Thank that you. does answer the question because you would have to relinquish both of the other two that's to fine. be on planning. Yeah, so and that's I think fine. the question was just trying to get at would you want to do that oh, in absolutely. that circumstance? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank other you. questions? No, don't think so. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I didn't see that. Chair, sorry about that. Um, thinking about, obviously, thank you for your, um, your commitment, obviously. Um, but thinking about sort of the role with the Planning Commission. Um, you know, what do you see are, are the biggest concerns when it comes to development here? I, I'm a big fan of the Measure H uh, stuff. I do like us in, you know, in building as opposed to sprawling. I think we have a lot of opportunities to still do that, and I think that uh, the city and, and those of you up here on the dais have done a great job in, in, in helping work to find places like uh, over, uh, over by the train tracks, the new development over there. I think uh, you know providing jobs in in Gilroy to keep people in Gilroy is a is a really really important thing and uh, and providing the, the type of growth here that's going to do that and keep balance uh, with that small town feel that we want to have. Okay, thank you. So Stephanie, you want to come on up and. Introduce yourself and tell us why you'd like to be on the Planning Commission. And everybody, again, this is for a term that expires December 31 of this year. Okay. So does that mean it's like a partial term? Or this, that's that exactly mean? what this is. We Got had it. somebody who we just appointed for a one-year term resign. Got it. And so now we're left with that seat open until December 31 of this year. Okay. Well, my name is Stephanie Okada McCabe. I'm uh, born and raised here in Gilroy. Uh, went away to college, got my degree in architecture, and came back and raising my family here. And um, yeah, I just I really would like to contribute to our community. Um, I've seen a lot of change over the years, and I've seen I've seen change, and then I've I've seen slow change and fast change. Right, so it's interesting just to see how things progress over time. Um, I think that. My background would be interesting in, in that um, specific board. In the past, I have served on the um, Building Board of Appeals, which wasn't very active, <laughs> and then the Physically Challenged Board, which that was actually really fun. Um, and then I, pre-COVID, I was volunteering at the Community Development um, Department, so that was a nice area to just see what happens on the other side of the counter and how how to provide that um, customer service to our community. Um, so yeah, I think that just my background and wanting to um, just kind of dive in a little bit more and see how we can, um, all, all of the board members' um, backgrounds can complement each other moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Rotover, do you want to ask the same question, please? Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for the work that you've done. So just, again, talking about growth and development, uh, what concerns, if any, do you have regarding sort of you know, development here in the city? Um, I'd say so, well, personally, I've seen some uh, interesting um, scenarios with, like, the SB9s and um, just in, in my background, um, ADUs are really hot right now, as you guys know. So just seeing that aspect from homeowners and like their concerns and and their wants and their drives and and, and the design aspect of trying to mitigate um, any potential issues with adjacent neighbors, um, but you know having the kind of the best of both worlds, right? So I think juggling that. Um, on, on on the civilian side is really really intriguing to me, but seeing the um, the more government side of of sprawl and how maybe how the SB nine um, just kind of affects the growth 
and or I mean we're at the early stages of it right so um, I'm curious how that'll pan out in the long run but as far as um, the overall layout of Gilray I, I, I mean I remember back in the day when luxury day spa was a one movie theater and my dad was you know taking me to go see a movie so the, just seeing the things change over the years and uh, it's just been it's been wonderful so yeah I, I hope that kind of answers your question you're welcome Else? I just I'd like to know why now because you're someone who's been in Gilroy and you haven't been on those other commissions in a little while right yeah so what 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 sparked the interest in planning commission today so I um, well one it, it popped up and I was like oh I have it's always popping I, up just so you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, ha I feel like I have the time my little one is um, really self-sufficient uh, in school right now so I I feel like I can definitely um, donate and you know really provide to the community and so why not why not yeah, now right better um, would better. you want to go beyond this partial term most definitely okay. so, so you would reapply yes yeah okay. definitely for right. sure so I think it would be a good kind of get your feet wet and go okay yeah be like this is definitely something that I can do and do you have any, I'm sorry everybody, but do you have any interest at all on the other commissions, Parks and Rec or Personnel? Um, I, I mean, I can glance at them, but this was probably my number one. Okay, yeah. that's fine. That's, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So that was just interviews. Thank you both for being here. Um, the July 10th meeting is uh, when we'll be doing the appointments. Okay, on to 8.1, which is review of open meeting and transparency laws and ordinance, ordinances. And this is a presentation, an annual presentation, basically, by our city attorney on the Brown Act, Open Government Ordinance, and Public Records Act. Is that on? Yes. Okay. How about that? Does that sound reasonable volume level? Yeah. You can hear me? Okay. Great. Oops. Didn't mean to do that. trying to get rid of the keyboard here. <laughs> Hang on a second here. Sorry. Not quite sure what's going on here. Okay. I'm, I'm going to leave the keyboard alone now. Don't worry, Bryce. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I've been asked to uh, provide three training sessions and this is the first one. They're each one, the uh, concept is each one would be an hour or less. I welcome questions as we go along and be happy to, uh, to respond if, you, if something piques your interest. As I said, this is the first training session. It'll cover some topics under the Brown Act, uh, less so under the Open Government Ordinance and the Public Records Act, but those are the three topics. Mostly I'm going to be talking about Brown Act and about um, so about meetings under the Brown Act and about use of social media. We've talked about many of these things before, but refresher training is, I think, very helpful because these issues constantly come up in uh, city business. The plan is to have another training session in August to cover FPPC conflicts and council norms, and then in September a more uh, subject-focused session which would cover how, certain housing laws, public contracting, design build, and then I believe Jimmy will also give training on emergency operations. So let's talk about some of the Brown Act issues that do with meetings. As uh, you all know on the council, and hopefully members of the public realize as well, 
Um, the Brown Act is the fundamental law under which city councils in the state of California operate. It requires that local uh, agency business be conducted in public. It protects the public's right to access uh, legislative bodies. It requires that we have agendas that are posted and prepared in advance. And it requires that we can't discuss and take action on items that are not on an agenda. Uh, and it also allows the public to comment on all agenda items. This is an, the not discussing items on an agenda comes up all the time because, for example, in our current the way we do agendas, the issue of future future council agenda items that we have at every meeting. We had one today. Nobody said anything. But when people do have an item, we have to talk about it enough to know whether the council wants to put it on the agenda for the future, but not enough to actually discuss it. And of course, we can't take action on it. The council also can, if, for example, if a member of the public raises an issue, direct staff to look into it and come back with a report. That sort of minimal kind of non-discussion is allowable but we can't have uh, extended discussions about the merits of a future council item. And several times that's happened, and I've appreciated it when council members have said, wait a minute, we're getting too far afield here. We have to back off a bit. The Brown Act applies to the city council. It also applies to other policy bodies, like the Planning Commission, for example, or all the city commissions. And there's always an issue about what about temporary committees, what about subcommittees, does it apply to them? Generally speaking, it does not apply to a subcommittee of less than a quorum if it's an ad hoc subcommittee. In other words, if the council appoints a committee with two or three council members on it to meet for a year on one particular issue, that is not necessarily a Brown Act committee. However, if there is a quorum on the committee, in other words, four council members or more, or if the committee lurches into a situation where it becomes a standing committee, in other words, it kind of keeps going and then the council decides to extend it, then that committee most likely becomes a Brown Act committee and has to follow the same procedures that the council itself has to follow. And we had that actually with the downtown committee, which as initially formed was a non-Brown Act committee meeting for a year. The decision was made to extend it. We said that will be a Brown Act committee. And of course, when five council members got on it, then it definitely became a Brown Act committee. There wasn't any question about that. Would you like questions as we go or at a certain point? I, I would say uh, as we go is fine. Council Member Armendaris, did you have a question? I do. Thank you. Oh. Um, on the previous slide, Andy, you talk about um, the public can comment on all agenda items. That includes your report and the city manager's report. Is that correct? No, actually it doesn't. It shouldn't say all, all items. It should say almost all items. It doesn't include ceremonial items either or proclamations and things like that. It doesn't include purely information items presented by staff, uh, like in the city attorney's report or this presentation. So but there's not, a fine line, and it's not exactly clear always where that is. Okay. So not ceremonial items, not the city manager's report. Right, and, and not, not the city attorney's report. Nothing that is strictly informational. That's correct. Or and there may be some nothing. other things too, but most uh, of the, all of the action items on the agenda certainly are subject to public comment. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So what are meetings? Um, under the Brown Act, meetings are defined very loosely. It says any congregation of a majority of the members of a legislative body at the same time and location, including teleconference locations, to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take any action within an item that is a subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. This is a very broad definition, and actually it's even broader than this because meetings can occur on Facebook. Meetings can occur on social media. Meetings can occur on emails if somebody replies all. We'll talk more about that. We've certainly warned you about that in the past. It includes things called serial meetings, which are meetings that are not intended to be meetings. But if one council member talks to another one and then another and another and another one at a time, if they're talking about matters of city business and if they're uh, discussing these, these city matters, that can be a serial meeting. And it doesn't mean that a council member can't talk to another council member, but you have to be very careful when you do it not to say, by the way, I talked to another member and 
here's how they see the issue. Because as soon as you get four people doing that, you've got a meeting. And so there are, there are cities that have gotten into trouble. I think I mentioned to you perhaps before a Fremont case where the city manager had a uh, process where every once a week he would meet for breakfast with the council. And there were five members on the council. So he would meet at a table in a coffee shop with two of them. Then he'd move to another table with another two. And then he went to the third table where the last council member was. And that was held to be a meeting of all five of them. There was an obvious kind of subterfuge as a way of getting around having them meet together. But it doesn't work, as you can imagine. On the other hand, for example, the city administrator could talk to each of you and give you information. He can't ask you, are you okay with this? Do you, do you approve of this project, for example, in the, in the boldest form? But he can provide information or a council member can provide information. So it's a little uh, iffy about what is a meeting and what isn't, but that's a big issue on social media. And it can include, of course, phone calls, as I say there, emails, social media, text messaging, and so forth. There are exceptions. Uh, obvious exceptions, council members are allowed to talk to the public. They're allowed to talk to their staff. They're allowed to talk to each other, actually, too. I don't mean to imply that you can never talk to each other. But you can't do it in a way that constitutes a meeting of the quorum. Council members can go to conferences. Hypothetically, if four council members went to a League of California Cities meeting, three of them could talk about city business. But if the fourth person sits down at the dinner table, that would be an illegal meeting if it continues to talk about city business. So you have to be very careful about that. There are meetings of other legislative bodies you can attend. There are social events and things of that nature as well. And the last... Um, the last uh, item here on the, on, talks about standing or temporary committees. That's, that's the item we talked about before. And to determine whether a temporary committee is a Brown Act committee, we'll look at does it meet on a fixed schedule. Of course, it has, if it has a quorum, it's clearly a Brown Act committee. Does it have continuing jurisdiction or is it simply ad hoc over one minor issue? Or one issue, I shouldn't say minor issue. And then, by the way, there's, there's an um, interesting decision uh, from the Attorney General about attendance by others that basically says if you were to appoint a standing committee that had, say, two council members on it and others want to attend, they would have to attend only as observers. They can't speak. They can't take part in any way. Uh, presumably that means they can't raise their hand, smile, do any, anything that indicates assent to discussions of city business. So it's something to be careful about. There's an interesting San Jose case that came out some time ago where San Jose has had a policy in certain administrations where council members will issue memoranda on projects. So, for example, a project is coming through the council, and there are 10 council members and a mayor, so there are 11 votes in San Jose. Sometimes as many as five council members will sign off on a memo that says, we all think this is a good project. They don't get six because that would be illegal to have six. However, there was a case where there was a memo with essentially the five. I'm changing the facts a little bit. And in an elevator, one of the five talked to a sixth and said, what do you think about the memo? And the sixth said something like, well, it's okay with me, or sort of I agree without exactly saying it. And that was held to be an illegal meeting because the sixth council member, in effect, signed on to the memo. So it's something that, again, we don't do that here in Gilroy, but it's, it's something that one has to be careful about. There's um, also, uh, for example, suppose you were contacted by an applicant for a project, and the applicant went to each one of you. He, in Gilroy, we allow that. Applicants can do that. They're allowed to do it. However, if they start to say, well, I could talk to Council Member Tovar, and he told me he supports the project, please shut them up. That, that could be an illegal meeting because you are learning how other council members feel about a given project. So it's odd because we don't normally control the uh, conduct of non-city people, but nonetheless, we could, in theory, get in trouble because of that. Andy? Yes. If somebody says, I have support from other members but doesn't specify whom, does that count? Who knows? I would say it's best to you say, look, know. I can't talk about that. All I can, we can talk about your project. 
I can't even tell you whether I'm going to vote for it or not. That's the safest thing to say. Because if you try to parse it too fine and say, well, I'm saying something, but it's, it's not really in prohibited territory, who knows how that will get heard or what that person you talk to will say you said, which might be a little different than you think you said. So it, it's something that we just have to be careful about. Okay, uh, what I want to talk about now is virtual meetings. And this is, the reason I'm talking about this is this is something that has changed in the last couple of years. It's very confusing. We keep hearing about other cities doing things differently. And people are asking, why can't we do this? Why don't we set up our meetings in a certain way? So I'm going to try to explain the current status of virtual meetings, which is really a mess. Okay, so it's, but nonetheless, I will try to make it understandable. Under the Brown Act, before COVID, before we had all this technology, there was always the allowance for a certain kind of teleconferencing. I didn't call it teleconference. I just called it a council member being away at a remote site. Uh, this typically would happen, and we did this in Gilroy from time to time when a council member was on vacation, for example, but wanted to attend the meeting remotely. Uh, we've had a number of council members do that. And that ability to do that, when I, I call it traditional Brown Act teleconferencing provision, this provision is still in the Brown Act. It doesn't get the press that it used to because there are other methods, but this, this is still there. And what it requires is that it all be set up in advance so that the agenda and the notice of the meeting have to specify that Council Member X will be attending remotely and here's where. It might be at a hotel or, a, or their house or their a vacation home or in an, even in another country. Um, and, of course, the kicker is that remote lo the remote location must be publicly accessible. So the council member who's, let's say, in a hotel has to arrange so somehow his door or her door is open or available to be opened. They have to post a copy of the agenda. And in theory, at least, they have to welcome a member of the public to go in to the... Now, in terms of these kind of travel things, I've never heard of that actually happening, but that's the Brown Act requirement. And when a council member calls in, they confirm that that's what they have done. And that's all okay, and that's, as I say, has been in the Brown Act for years. There are certain requirements, uh, including that a quorum of council members must still be in the city. And you can do audio or visual... And the council member doesn't have to have, under this approach, an actual excuse. And I mention that because the next thing we'll get to does involve excuses. Uh, but so a council member can simply be traveling on vacation and wants to sign in remotely. And if the city agrees and, and cooperates with the agenda, that can be done. Now, the next thing that came along was AB 361 due to COVID. And you'll remember for starting in March of 2020 and going on for a year, or a little over a year, this council met virtually. And it was completely virtual. We just all met on Zoom. That was a special law that's not in effect anymore. So we have to kind of forget all that. I think a lot of people thought that there were positive elements to those meetings. Many members of the public certainly reported that they enjoyed them. They liked the idea that instead of having to come here and wait while somebody drones on about something you're not interested in, you could come, you could just uh, watch in, in the background and be multitasking at home. So there was widespread assumption, certainly on, on the attorney's parts, that the legislature would think of some way of, of making that permanent. And they came up with this monstrosity called AB 2449 <laughs> instead. Uh, the AB 361, the one that allowed the complete virtual meetings, has gone away because it only applied while there was a state of emergency, and that's been clear as of February of this year. So AB 2449 is the legislature's attempt to allow a different kind of teleconferencing slightly. And it, it puts requirements on the city and it puts requirements on the council member who's absent. So let me explain some of these, and I think you'll, you'll see as I go through it, why I called it a monstrosity. So it allows teleconferencing, but there still must be a quorum of the council at a physical location. So for us, that would mean there still has to be at least four of you here. Uh, the, remote per the person who is appearing remotely, the council member, must have two-way audio-visual participation. So in effect, that means an internet Zoom or 
Microsoft Teams or something. The public can participate remotely, but not at that person's location. Or at least, let me put it that way, the person does not have to reveal the location. That part of the Brown Act is not required under this law. So that's the one advantage it has, that if someone's traveling, for example, they don't have to worry about listing on the agenda where they're going to be, and they don't have to allow the public to, to come in. Uh, and the, that's the last uh, bullet point here. The remote, re, remote location need not be disclosed or made available. Now, uh, for the member, though, what, what do you have to do if you want to take advantage of this? And these are truly strange laws. You have to, a council member has to have either just cause or an emergency circumstance. Okay, and these are two separate, separate clauses in the law. An emergency circumstance means a physical or family medical emergency that prevents a member from attending in person. So that's relatively straightforward. There must be a brief statement about what it is without disclosing any medical privacy information. So some kind of uh, medical emergency. But it has to be physical or family medical emergency. Just cause is different. Just cause includes child care and care of family members, and there's a whole list of them, a contagious illness, and then another one is a need related to a physical or mental disability as a defined in the government code or travel on official business. And I actually looked up the need related to physical or mental disability. It goes on for pages. It's very wide-ranging in terms of those kind of disabilities. It's a much larger definition. Leanne probably knows this as, uh, from her job uh, than the federal law. The state law of disability is very broad. But anyway, but there are restrictions. And it, the, this participation must be authorized by the council. And just cause, just cause, the word just implies there's something right about the cause. It's okay. But it can only be used twice per year by a council member. So there's a limit. There's no reason given why that's a limit. And either just cause or emergency circumstance, um, excuse me, cannot re participate remotely for th more than three months or 20% of the meetings. They try to figure out what that really means. I mean, if Gilroy meets roughly 24 times a year, 20% uh, is less than five meetings. Three months, we have six meetings. Does that mean you can have one meeting one month and one another? I really don't know. And we've never, we have never taken this into account. We've never been requested to do this. And I know Ty has told me, the city clerk, that in fact in the city clerk world, there's widespread belief that this is not a very useful thing because it's so complicated. In addition, by the way, if uh, we set up such a meeting and the public then can participate remotely, there must be a two-way audio-visual link with the public or a two-way audio link and a webcast. You know, a webcast is a one-way video link. And if it goes down, you have to stop. You have to, literally have to stop the meeting until it gets fixed. So it's one of these things that, in theory, I think the state legislature wanted to say that we are relaxing the old rule of the Brown Act about having to make your site available to the public. But in return, they put in so many issues here and so many procedural hurdles that I think this will be a very difficult thing actually to do. And it's a big disappointment because everybody thought that there would be some sensible remote thing that came out of the legislature, but it hasn't happened. And I think when it starts to happen, then there are various media and transparency interests that jump into gear and kind of prevent that and are afraid that if, uh, if people are operating remotely, there'll be some sort of skullduggery going on. And in fact, one of the requirements is the remote council member has to um, identify anyone over the age of 18 who's in the room with, with them and, and what that person is doing. Like it could be a caregiver or a family member or whatever. So in any event, that, that's the current status of virtual meetings. Yes, Leanne. Can you explain what it means uh, to be authorized by council? Uh, what it means is that the, the council really has to agree to put the system together uh, and to allow this to happen. Because, if, if, for example, if, if part of the allowing the member to uh, work remotely or to call in remotely is that the public has to be allowed to call in remotely too. That requires staffing and it requires somebody to manage a phone system or 
a second, possibly an internet connection. So I think cities that are doing it to the extent they can do remote tie-ins typically have two clerks. And that's a staffing issue, and you have to make sure that your internet is good because if it goes down, you have to stop. So it, I think that in th that's the sense. Also, um, the council simply has to has to agree has to agree that this makes sense. Now, the council has to agree to the old-fashioned Brown Act remote thing too, in the sense that it goes on the agenda and goes in the notice. So there has to be essentially a prior agreement. That has never been an issue in Gilroy. I think we've always done it when someone uh, has requested it. I have a couple questions too. Um, official business is that official city business, or could it be official business of our individual professions or work? Well, here's what it says. It says, travel while on official business of the legislative body or another state or local agency. Okay. So not your work. Not your work. Got it. And then my other question, does anything uh, or absent a absent council member, does anything in AB 2449 prevent us from having, uh, from allowing the public to comment virtually? No. No. In, in theory, we could do that. Uh, in theory, we could do that, but again, I think that, that's really a staffing issue and, and, a, and a technology issue. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of technology, uh, now that I've depressed you with this one, let me go on to talk about some of the social media issues that come up uh, in dealing with social media, dealing with technology, dealing with council business. This is, you've probably seen this before, do not reply all. and. This is because of a desire not to have an inadvertent Brown Act meeting. Pretty much the only exception to that is if the city clerk were to send an email to everybody saying, what's your availability for a special meeting next week on a certain date? It's okay to reply all, but if you do, as we say there, don't editorialize, meaning don't say I'm available on Wednesday and it's a great project or anything to that effect, but just deal with availability only. The other um, issue, of course, is Personal emails are disclosable. We've, we've talked about this before. The leading case is from San Jose where a Public Records Act request was made for emails and text messages. And this is the case came out that went to the California Supreme Court in 2017's reported decision. And the Supreme Court, the city said, well, when council members are using emails on their private devices, not using their city account, but they just have a Gmail account or whatever it is, we don't have we don't have custody or control of these documents. They're not city records. We, we, you know, we don't even know what they are. We don't know if they exist, and we don't control them. And the court said, well, that doesn't really matter. It, it, you still, th these are, in effect, city records, and there has to be some way to get them. Um, so they are within the ambit of the Public Records Act. The court essentially blessed a process whereby they said, you can simply, you, the city clerk who, to whom a, a request comes in, can request that individual council members do a search themselves and then sign an affidavit saying, I have searched and either I have nothing or here's what I have. It doesn't require the production of private emails uh, or text messages, but sometimes it's hard to know what's private and what isn't. And there can be mixed things. The court gives a, a, a number of examples about uh, people complaining about coworkers at their city not being a public message, even though they're complaining about their coworker. Um, but in any event, it's the assumption now is that personal, uh, uh, private accounts are subject to production under the Public Records Act, and therefore the recommendation always is to keep your official business on your official city accounts. The clerk can search for them in the email server then. Uh, and you don't worry about your own privacy issues that way. That's the safest thing to do. And so that, that has been our recommendation, and it continues to be our recommendation, of course. Let's talk a little bit about social media. Um, there are different issues that arise in social media, some of which we have grappled with a little bit here. Uh, the Brown Act finally was amended last year to deal with social media. We sent a memo around explaining these changes. There are several changes. Uh, mainly the Brown Act now says it's okay for a council member to have a social media account, which is defined basically as an account that's open to the public uh, without charge. 
And the council member can use it to communicate with his constituents, uh, can use it to solicit feedback from them, and can, and can use it to uh, send out information to them as well. It's somewhat like sending a news, it's kind of the analog of sending newsletters out, except you can also get input back from them. What you cannot do is deal with each other's social media account because there's too much danger of it becoming a meeting. So, for example, if one of you has a Facebook account, another council member cannot comment on it. They cannot, re they, you can't retweet a tweet from a council member. You can't send, put emojis on the account. You can't forward the, the something to somebody else because that implies some sort of approval. So these are, these are matters of uh, interaction that are different than the way people normally interact. And that's why we, we, we've emphasized that you have to be careful. And the Brown Act requirements that allow you to do this are very specific. So uh, in other words, liking, you can't like someone else's post. Or you can't take that post and transmit it to someone else. You can't respond to it or send a little happy face emoji or anything like that. So that's an extremely important thing as, as it relates to not having a meeting. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure I understand this one because this now has nothing to do with the number of council members, just any council member? Right. Yeah, that, that is correct. And the reason for that is that if one council member starts to do that, then another one may see it or see it, and, and you can't control. Right. No, I understand that. Right. But if, but okay. Because, I mean, like, Councilmember Tovar just posted about the art show, and I commented, sorry, I couldn't be there. Shouldn't have done that. Our recommendation is not to do that, yes. Okay, even though I did it for, as a personal, it was not, yeah. Okay. But who knows I'm just, what's personal I'm just trying to get yes. clarification, because yeah. mm -hmm. I always thought that, because I know, like, on next door, that's what I'm always telling people, is you can't, right. it's not a fair discussion, because one council, someone could say something, and not everybody gets the same opportunity, because it's all been violated now. That, that, um, that, that, I think that is true. Yeah, no, that, that I get. I just didn't yeah. realize that just a single person on a on a mm -hmm. post about mm -hmm. an art show right. would would be some. Okay, so we should just stay off of each other's pages. Period. Don't like. That, that don't, is, don't that is the safest, most conservative advice that, that you should do. That yes. City business or not, right? Yeah, because this wasn't Even this wasn't stuff. Right? Well, we'll before. get to that point in a minute about what city okay. business and what isn't, because that's the, the kind of the next. Yeah, no, because I think issue, that yeah. I think that distinction though is whether it's your personal page or your city council page. Some people use their city council page and post mm -hmm. personal stuff, or vice versa, use their personal page but post actual city uh, city business on their personal page. That, that's I've exactly seen that right. too. That, that's exactly right, and there are a couple of court cases I'm going to talk about in just a minute that deal with that, and we, which I've mentioned to you before, which deal with that exact issue. And it's a very confusing, um, difficult issue. And, and the, the, the suggestions we're giving to you for the best conservative advice kind of goes against the normal social mores of how we interact on social media. So it, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to, digest, hard to, to take sometimes, but it, but it is what we should do. Let's talk about what, what is personal versus what is public. Um, as you know, there's an issue about public forums or public forum, uh, and we, we've dealt with this in the past, for example, having, like the flag policy that the city adopted uh, last year, two years ago. The issue there was is if you let anybody put up any flag, then you can't, you have to be content neutral. You can only, if you let all, on freedom of discussion reign, you cannot regulate as to, con as to content. And the courts will look at this as a public forum, like the, towns, the town square where people are getting up and saying political views, and saying the only way you can regulate and prevent somebody from saying something you don't like is if uh, it's the narrowest possible regulation designed to uphold a compelling government interest. In other words, what lawyers call strict scrutiny. And courts never find that. There's a kind of a presumption of invalidity. So, for that reason, when we, did, when we set up the flag policy, we wrote it that flying a flag is city speech. It's not public speech. People can apply. The city decides which kind of flag it wants to fly, and that becomes the city's viewpoint. And there you can discriminate. In other words, as a city, we did the same thing we talked about putting banners across Monterey at one point. And there was a proposal to allow any organization to put up any banner and then said, well, wait a minute, what if an organization that you really disapprove of wants to put up a banner. 
you have to let them do that if, if it's a public forum and you're not regulating it for your own speech. So the same issue arises in the social media accounts, and it arises further uh, with respect to blocking other people's comments on your accounts. So, and that issue becomes a first, these become first U.S. Constitution First Amendment issues. We've talked about this several times. Um, the Brown Act requires that you not block, the, that the public have access to your account. We believe that this can be subject to certain reasonable rules. And in fact, if you look at the City of Gilroy's social media policy, there's an appendix attached to that that's actually a set of rules that I would recommend that everybody put on their social media accounts because the law is very vague about it, but presumably you can prevent threats, you can prevent certain kinds of profanity, probably some defamation. You can't prevent somebody from posting just because you don't like them or just because they don't like you, which is more likely to be the case. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, speaking about that, again, you, you brought up what I was going to bring up. You know, it's a violation of the First Amendment, right? So if I, on my personal or my city council Facebook, if I'm not allowing anyone to um, comment, no matter what that comment is, I mean, like I said, if it's negative, it's uh, threatening, I can, I can delete them. But if it's the public wanting to make a comment on what I've stated Where's I mean? Well, you don't have to allow anyone to. You, you you don't have to allow comments at all. You can say no comments, but if you allow comments, you can't censor them by content. That's the problem. That's if if it's an official account. That's exactly the issue that arises in these cases. Got it. So if I make a post, I can set my settings where I I'm not going to allow anyone to comment on that. That's that's our recommendation is if you. If you have an account where you don't let people comment, that's better. If you do it post by post, mm. somebody could say you're actually regulating content because certain content you're allowing people to right. say with, on this post, but on this other post on a different topic, you're not allowing comment. And that's right. a con not a content neutral regulation. That argument could be made against you if you did that. that. Let's say that argument, I, I, I'm violating that. What, what happens to me? In theory, you could be sued for violation of the First Amendment. Okay. The city would perhaps not defend you because it might be something you're doing in your individual capacity. If you lose the case, you could be subject to mainly attorney's fees, mm. but you could also spend a lot of money defending yourself. As a fact, let me tell you about two cases yeah. where that's exactly happened. Okay? The first case is called Linkey versus Free. These are both cases that have been taken by the U.S. Supreme Court. So... Linkey versus Freed uh, involved a, and the issue in each case is, is this account by a public official a public account or a private account? So in the Linkey case, the court starts out, I think, interesting to see what you think from the way the opinion's written. The court starts out saying, James Freed prized his roles as a father, husband, and city manager of Port Huron, Michigan. Like many Americans, James Free joined Facebook to connect with friends and family. He created a Facebook profile. In 2014, Freed was appointed city manager for Port Huron, so he updated his Facebook page to reflect his new title. Okay, this case is from the 6th District Federal Court in that area. It concluded that his account was a personal account, not a city account. And they used a test. I, I'm not going to go into it in detail because it's pretty complicated. But the court basically said he wasn't required to do this account. He didn't use city resources. But it was a very mixed account, and clearly they could have gone the other way. Contrast that with um, a case called Garnier involving two uh, school trustees. And here, here's how the court in that case frames, uh, talks about their account. Consistent with the trustees' official identifications on their social media pages, the content of the trustees' pages was overwhelmingly geared toward providing information to the public about the board's official activities and soliciting input from the public on policy issues. I think you can tell that case came out the other way. In that case, the court said, this is a city account, not a private account. And the issue in each case was that the official had blocked public criticism. So those cases are both in front of the U.S. Supreme Court now because... 
The sixth district case, the, the first one I mentioned to you, said, we disagree with the standards that are used in four other federal circuits. And the Ninth Circuit, which is ours, which decided the second case, the Garnier case, said, we have read the Linkey case and we disagree with it. So it's now in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. It'll be interesting to see what happens. But what it underlines, though, is the difficulty of when you have an account, like many people do, where you have personal stuff and, and business stuff and all kinds of stuff, uh, it can get characterized in a way that might be harmful. So, Andy, just to gauge yeah. yourself, it's been 35 minutes, just Good. so you gauge. Okay. No, that's fine. And, in fact, I probably have another 10 or less. So uh, I think I'm in, we're in good shape. I know you have this fear that I'm going to go on all night. but <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, that finishes, actually, the discussion of the Brown Act. Uh, okay. Although anybody who wants to know more about those two cases, I have more information on it. Uh, let me talk briefly about OGO. OGO is Gilroy's own sunshine law. Uh, it was enacted in 2008. Two council members ran for council on the basis that they would enact such a law and that it would uh, sort of shape up the staff that they were running against, so to speak. Anyway, so it's been in, in, in existence for almost 15 years. Um, it does several things. One is it has its own sections that are sort of like the Brown Act. It also deals with public records and has some procedural issues. And then it establishes something called the Open Government Commission. The Brown Act requirements in the OGO are very similar to the actual Brown Act itself. They, they have really hardly affected city practice at all because they're quite similar. Um, they're kind of duplicative of many different things. The, um, for example, on, the, um, on closed sessions, they allow the same kinds of closed sessions that the Brown Act does, you know, real estate, litigation, union, that kind of thing, employee uh, performance. They change the procedural rules slightly. And this is something that, we, that, that council members invariably get confused about. I was confused for quite a while until I finally beat it into my head. And the rule is that if the Gilroy Council is going into a closed session for litigation, then the council solicits advice from the city attorney who advises that, in his opinion, um, the, it would uh, damage the city's position to discuss this matter in open session, and the council has to take a vote before going into closed session. That's only for litigation, though. Okay? For any other closed session, we don't take a vote first. For any other closed session, we go into closed session and then take a vote to stay in as the first action. Okay? So in either case, a vote is required, but it's only required for litigation in advance. And for other closed sessions, it's required once we're in closed session, the council votes to stay in closed session or not to. Um, I, I wanted to mention at the bottom here, I, I mentioned limited attendance confidentiality. Just to underline that discussions that go on in closed sessions are confidential. They may not be revealed. There's a recent um, attorney general opinion on the subject of attendance because we often get asked by, not often, but from time to time, um, the city's contemplating doing some real estate transaction and somebody else wants to come in, the other side, a broker for the other side or the other party. Or even in litigation, it could be the other lawyer wants to explain their settlement offer. That's not permitted. We, we cannot do that. That would destroy the uh, confidence of the, of the closed session. The attorney general opinion dealt with politicians in larger arenas who have staff. And they would have their staff sit in closed sessions. The attorney general said, no, staff cannot sit in closed sessions unless they're essential to it. For example, it could be a staff member knows more than anybody and has been active, and that would be appropriate. However, they can't sit in to take notes and just help their council member or their legislator. So it's a very strict opinion, again, emphasizing the confidentiality and the closedness of executive sessions. The Open Government uh, Ordinance also establishes the OGO Commission, which was mentioned of briefly. Um, it has five members, all of whom are members of the public. When it was initially established, actually, uh, several of the members were council members, but it, by its own uh, terms, that uh, uh, changed to make all, of, all the members public members. The city attorney is the legal advisor, according to the OGO. 
The OGO is supposed to hear appeals of Public Records Act requests. That's very rare, however. It, it, it also can propose amendments to the OGO itself, and it can receive reports on PRAs, uh, PR, uh, on the status of Public Records Act requests. Yes. And back on the closed sessions, I want to be clear that anything, any subject matter discussed in closed session is confidential, correct? That's correct. It's not, the, the, not just a real estate thing. It can be when we're doing labor negotiations, too. That is all supposed to that, that stay is here. Thank you. That is correct, yeah. That, yes, because if it's confidential enough to be a closed session, it has to stay confidential. Right. Okay? Right. Yeah. Andy? Yeah. But now, what about if we're in closed session and a council member tells a, a bargaining group or some, some group something that didn't happen? They're lying about it. They can't get in trouble then, can they? <laughs> well, they don't get in trouble. I guess the answer to your question would be they won't get in trouble for uh, violating the confidence of the closed session, but it might be an unfair labor practice or many other things. So it's not a recommended strategy. Okay. All right. Uh, finally, the Public Records Act. Um, this, as you know, people have a right to the public records of the public's business. Generally, courts interpret the PRA in favor of disclosure, not always. But what's striking uh, is they have no sympathy, as I say here, for the city's workload or expense. Uh, they, and, they have no, and there's no exception to disclosure of records because it's embarrassing or it would make the city look bad or an individual council member look bad. So we assume almost everything is ultimately could be made public. And that's a, a good way to proceed in terms of dealing with documents that you have yourself. Um, from the council's or city standpoint, what strikes me about Public Records Act requests is there's a lot of staff time and cost that goes into uh, complying with them. It's really quite onerous. And generally speaking, they are not, um, uh, not recoverable. You can get copying expenses, for example, but not the cost of the person doing the copying. There's a case that involved uh, another city where 40,000 documents were to be produced, uh, and the court, that had to be uh, literally photocopy. And the city said, well, that's excessive, it's burdensome. The court said, no, oh, no, it's just 40,000 documents. What are you worried about? So, but that's a sort of typical attitude, for better or for worse. So we have to live with it, but it does sap city um, time and resources, and in the police department particularly, which receives dozens and dozens of requests every month. Okay, uh, this is my last slide, actually, and just talking about their, their oh, excuse me. Yeah, there are exceptions for various things, personnel records, drafts, uh, attorney-client privilege. Police records used to be much more exempt. Now there have been several laws that you probably know about where uh, police records of certain kinds of encounters, uh, using excessive force, sexual abuse, things like that, uh, have to be made available. Um, so uh, with that, I think I'll conclude, unless anybody has any particular questions. There's a last slide here for questions. I have one. Is, um, does anything that you discussed here tonight uh, regulate or govern the use of uh, cell phones from the dais to communicate? Mm -hmm. uh, probably not, although that's, that's regulated in our council norms. Uh, where we, we say that it, that should not be used and if a council member takes an emergency family call, they should leave the dais because it gives the impression of council members receiving other information. And in fact, so it's going back to something I didn't mention in the slide, let me, let me uh, sure. continue for a second. Um, one of the problems of having uh, discussions with applicants, with other people in advance of meeting, and we talk about, is ex-party communications. For example, if a matter comes to you that you're giving a use permit or something like that, which is a quasi-judicial act, you're supposed to base your decision on evidence received that everybody, that's, everybody can see. This is the evidence that's received. This is what's said at the hearing. This is what came in in advance. Um, to the extent, and that's why we have ex-party disclosures. That's why we at, at the start of such a hearing, council members are asked, have you had ex-party contact? And if so, did you learn anything that's not generally available? So the same issue can be raised about cell phone use at the dais. In other words, it appears, it can appear to the public that a council member is getting information that is different 
and is not publicly available. And that could be a violation of due process for an applicant or an opponent of a project. So for these reasons, it's not a good policy to use cell phones at the days. It's not specifically prohibited by the Brown Act, but it's it's a from, bad idea and it's prohibited yeah, by our norms. From from here. I'm, yes. I'm talking from the dais because to yeah. me it's a transparency issue. Right. Nobody it else is. is privy to a conversation that you're having while you're deliberating. That's and, correct. And that right. shouldn't be allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That, and that, that, I think that's the answer. Okay. The answer is it is allowed. It's just poor form. The, the answer is it's not allowed. It's, it's not specifically not allowed by the Brown Act. It is not allowed by our, or it's discouraged by our norms itself. Uh, and it could raise, give the city liability in an, in an instance where it's alleged to be a violation of due process because it's secret information that nobody else knows. Right. That's so. my point. And I think you made an important point, Andy, is that if you're having a family emergency, step down from the desk mm -hmm. and take your call or do your messaging with your family member and then return. Right. So and th that's what our norms perception. say. Our norms yeah. do say so that, yes. Perception. Right. Okay. Are there any other questions or are we... Any other questions? Okay. Okay, thank you. Good, my pleasure. All right. I just turned off my mic, sorry. Okay, that brings us to the consent calendar, item nine. So I'm going to first ask uh, council members if there's anything to remove of the nine items. Yes, I'd like to remove item 9.9. .9. Okay, anything else? So item 9.9 .9 is removed. Um, before I ask for a, a, well, before I go to public comment on the other eight items, I want to point out that um, I, I didn't realize I found an error in the minutes that just referenced highways 101 and 25 as 101 and 125. Mm -hmm. And in asking for that simple correction, I caused all of us to get a separate email mm -hmm. and a bunch of paperwork to go. And so I have learned that in the future, when I see an error like that, I'll just say it at the meeting and not in advance, because that's all it was. It should have been 101.25 instead of 101.125. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on items one through eight? I don't believe so, Madam Mayor. Just let me check one sure. here. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you want to speak on 9.1 .1 or 9.9? .9? On the action minutes? The one that's being separated, the one that's being 9 .9. separated is 9.9. .9. Yes. Okay. Move for so, approval. Then I have none. Okay. So no public comments. So I'll take a motion. Move for approval. Second. Okay. And that's with the change from 101 to 25. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, Madam Mayor, yeah. may I ask who's a motion and second? I'm sorry. The motion was made by Fred, Fred, Council Fred. Member Tovar and seconded by Council Member Bracco. Oh, shoot. Sorry, Dan. Oh. It's, it's Moved by Tovar, second. There, there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Armaderas? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Klein? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay. So 9.9. .9. Um, you asked for it to be pulled? Yes. Um, there's uh, members of the public who'd like to speak on it still, and I think that this item is important enough that it merits okay. some more time. So this is 9.9 .9 is the adoption of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy adding Chapter 5 to the Gilroy City Code relating to banning the use of certain public rights of ways and sleeping or living accommodations. Um, this was heard on May 15th and then voted upon on at the meeting on June 5th. Uh, both were open to public comment. Um, the last meeting on June 5th was a public hearing. Um, here we are tonight, and Ty, can you tell me how many people would like to speak on this again? I have three speaker cards at the moment, Madam Mayor. Three the, speaker cards? The okay. first speaker is Robert Aguirre, followed by Tristia Bauman, followed by Todd Lincoln. Um, and followed by Wes, so that's four. Can, would all of you please come to the front row so that we can, yes. And um, if you've, uh, yeah, since both of you spoke during the other part of the agenda, um, please be mindful. Okay. Go ahead. This is the agenda item. Okay. Sir, Let me stop. Just grab, yeah, your microphone. Yeah. Okay, can you reset the clock? <laughs> you have five seconds extra. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I, again, on this one particular item, I don't think you guys really realize how much damage is going to be caused to so many people 
that are already victims, that are people that are in survival mode, that are trying to just get their lives back together again. They're not all criminals. They're not all people that are alcoholics or, or drug addicts or anything else. They're people just like you and I, normal people. And I know I was one myself, so I know that uh, I can articulate very well. I'm educated, uh, but due to unforeseen situations that led me to be in that position, which was basically I had my own business and I was consulting to manufacturers. Where are all the manufacturers today? They're all overseas. Okay, so I was not willing to go and move to China in order to, to keep my job. So I ended up losing my job. I lost my house because I couldn't make uh, payments on it. I lost my business and all the materials in it because I couldn't afford to pay the storage fees. It, it, my, my life was turned completely upside down. My, uh, my wife ended up divorcing me as a result of that because I had no real income, not, not what she was used to. I used to make 200000 a year, and now I was working at 7-Eleven. That's the sort of thing that happens to people. And as a result of that, I still currently do not have contact with three of my children uh, from that same marriage. It, it has really put me at a real disadvantage in being able to continue and do the kind of work that I was doing. Um, again, I have no customers. All the, all the manufacturers have moved away. So therefore, it impacted me in a most significant way. So having to live in a car or having to live in a tent or having to live just wherever you can are things that happen to people that uh, put them in a very difficult situation. When you start limiting where people go and telling them that they cannot be in certain locations and you don't have an alternative place for them to go, then you're really violating them. You become uh, the, the bully that comes in after somebody has been raped and kicked that person around again and, and violating them one more time. And it creates a, such a distrust of the way the systems are and how things work. I, I think I know that you're trying to control the number of people that are living out in, outdoors. I get that. But this is not the way to do it. What we really need to do is focus on trying to find a safe place for people to go, especially women. The, the statistic is 50% of all women that are living outdoors have been raped. And that's just unspeakable. And when you continue to push people to the outer limits, then they, uh, they have no other choice. They have to do that for their own protection. And they give in to it because they know that that's the only thing that they can do. And that's, that's the position you're putting a lot of people into, where they are forced to do things that they would not normally choose to do. Oh, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next speaker is Trist Trista Bauman. Hello. My name is Tristia Bauman. I am the directing attorney of housing at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. I appeared at the last hearing to describe the vast amount of personal experience I have with lawsuits and policies that criminalize homelessness. I won't go over that again. I also won't ad nauseum repeat what I have provided in a written comment uh, to the council today. Um, but I want to make a few points clear. The city does not know whether it can enforce this ordinance consistent with the Constitution. It has done an incomplete analysis of what space is available for the resting conduct that is protected under Martin and under Johnson, the city of Grants Pass. The analysis is not complete. The city is risking liability under an Eighth Amendment theory. This is to say nothing of the lack of clarity that people who are unhoused have now about where they may lawfully rest. The city cannot constitutionally exclude all people who are too poor to afford housing and who do not have access to shelter from the city limits. People don't know where they can be. That lack of clarity and enforcement against people who are expected to conform their conduct with the prohibition can lead to a due process claim against the city. There's not enough analysis. And this is to say nothing of the fact patterns that can be developed as people are routinely displaced and dispossessed of their property at each moment of enforcement. The city is going down a road that will harm all of us. And I say this as a Gilroy resident and a mom of a child enrolled in in a Gilroy Unified School District school. I want what's best for this community. And federal guidance provides guidance to cities about what is best. 
We need to identify places where people can safely be. If we don't want people in the parks or along creeks or along roadways, we need to provide adequate, safe, secure, stable places where people can be, where they can meet their survival needs. It's really that simple. It's best practice, and it's what the federal government guides. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Todd Langton. Yes, thank you. I just want to acknowledge that we have a humanitarian crisis going on in Silicon Valley, going on in the state of California. We need to act accordingly. When we have abatements, there should be, I've seen so many abatement flyers out at the camps. You have the, the name of the abatement, the date, and when it's going to happen. But what there should be in the second part of the abatement is, here's where you can go, multiple places, the third part, and we're going to help you get there. But there's not that. We need to be humane about our actions. I just want to follow up on um, the previous speaker's comments. The, uh, the city of Chico, not, I don't believe they're too far different than the city of, of Gilroy as far as size. But they didn't learn from Martin versus Boise. And I urge all of you to Google Warren versus Chico and study what happened there. Just uh, I think it was about four years ago. And I just want to read a, a small little article. And this is after the, the courts found uh, in favor of the litigants against, against the city of Chico. According to the most recent statistics of the city, the initial startup cost for the pallet shelter cost was more than $3.7 million dollars while running the operational costs would run $1.5 million for at least the next five years. And this isn't to mention, and that's the, that's the community, that the, the pallet shelter community that the city of Chico had to build after they lost the lawsuit. This doesn't count the $650,000 that they had to pay for the legal fees for the, the two litigants. So it's just not good sense, it's common sense you don't want to do this. I'd urge you at least to postpone this until you have adequate shelters. If you're going to abate someone, you need to have somewhere for them to go. That is common sense. That, would, that is how you would want your family member treated if they were out there. And I suspect some of your family or friends or neighbors are out there in the fields and streets. Treat them humanely. This sounds cliche, and we hear this a lot in the advocate arena. We as Americans, especially Californians, tend to treat our pets much better than we do our fellow citizens. What you're proposing is simply not right. Follow the advice of people who know the previous two speakers and Jan Bernstein Chargan, who lives and operates uh, with compassion here in Gilroy. This is not the right thing to do. I urge you to postpone it. At the very least, I hope that you abate this amendment. But at the very least, postpone it until you have an adequate place for these people to go. That is the humane thing to do. You know it. And I urge you to vote your conscience, not the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Wes White. Hello, uh, Wes White, Salinas Monterey County Homeless Union, uh, part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, a national union of the homeless, California Homeless Union. Um, and, uh, I mean, we do get around, and we are trying to shape policy. I'm, I'm kind of sad and disappointed. I, I don't think we're going to get any change of uh, difference of opinion here. It'll probably end up being 6-1. Um, and so I kind of urge the public here in Gilroy, you know, um, to uh, register to vote and get involved in politics and actually um, take over these seats so that the job can actually get done humanely and correctly. Uh, we're, we're not really getting very far the way it is. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a comic club, man. You know, you guys are aspiring and already millionaires uh, and billionaires. You're gainfully employed. You're definitely on an upward track, shareholders. Got stocks. I mean, that's that's a paper world that many people will not be able to achieve. And now that they're too poor to afford rent, we're going to make money off of them. There's so many industries that, that we're paying. The police officers get a raise. In Salinas, I, I hear complaints. Man, we could go up to Gilroy, get paid more, and work less, and not work as hard, and be less stressful, and all me, 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 me. But it's supposed to be about public service. 
And I, I understand you've got to balance everything, but, you know, there again, you have to balance everything. Where do these people belong? What about the remainder? Some people get place, some people get housed, but what about the remainder? Just blanket open discrimination is redlining. You know, I mean, we're, we're doing our darndest to treat everyone like a Native American. If you're not paying, then you deserve to die. And that's not, it's not a healthy way to do business. It's not a healthy way to um, raise a society or operate. I mean, I remember hearing all this, uh, oh, it's a Democrat supervisor. I can't believe it. Do it yourselves. Why don't you do better? You're not even trying. Actually, you're, you're hurting people on purpose. You're making the state create a danger. And you're going to see a lot more people in front of your alcoves at downtown. Uh, places that you didn't want them before, so you're going to have to chase them out over there too. What, and so who gets paid? And who's paying it? It's human suffering. Eventual death. I don't see it going any other direction. That's why I think we need to replace some people, replace a mindset, so that we actually worry about community and the entire community, whether they're your favorite friends or people that don't even vote. Treat people better than you treat animals, please. Stop the sweeps. You know, 400 square feet and a structure. Running water and electricity, especially for women. Think about menstruation. There's, there's no... It's disgusting. In Salinas, they pushed everybody into the tracks, and nobody has a porty potty now. They, they took funding away. You've got no money to help I'm you. Sorry, all sir, kinds your of money time to is up. You. Stop Thank the you. sweeps. Ron Kirkus, you're next. Good evening again, uh, Mayor and Council and people. <clears throat> I suggest that we continue going in the direction that the Council has been going in. As you know, I send a lot of people information about issues of several kinds, including the homeless issue. What we normally see in this issue is these people, and I say that in a general manner, I don't mean it offensive, but these folks, if you offer them a lifestyle of a new home or whatever, housing, they don't want it. They want to live the life that they're living. They, that's not a lie. They have set in their minds that they like what they're doing. They like their drug abuse. They like their alcohol abuse. They don't want to have uh, any restrictions on their, on their nature, on their issues. And so if you put them in a housing or you put them in this place or that and that there's a restriction on it, they're saying, I don't want it. I'd rather live on a sidewalk. So this is what we have to deal with. This is the kind of decision you have to make. What do we want for our city? Do we want people that refuse to accept uh, housing because they want to keep going with their lifestyle? I don't think that's what we should approve of and encourage. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a new speaker now, Christian. Moa Dragon. I'm Christian Moa Dragon. I've never been homeless or anything, but I believe in doing things right. And like, I, like this is our city. We're all living here right now. Best thing is to do things right. And with the homeless control, or at the homeless where it's at right now. I think there was like a city that like, or a country, I forget which country it was, that said uh, homeless at, at once, I think it was China or somewhere around China, that said like homeless was illegal. So, like, they banned being homeless. And I guess people said comments on that, that that was the best time to live. But with the homeless things, I think there is a solution. We all got to get stronger as people, like, and work as a whole. Because if we keep fighting, I don't know, I don't think it's a fight. But I personally think that we got to get stronger as a unit, keep working as a unit. We got to work together. That we all gotta help out, can't just be one sided, we all gotta help out. So that's what I think that that's what I know we should do. And uh, my area is like I said, I got the downtown area. I'm a barber over there, Frank's Barbershop. And uh, it's not really much homeless. I try to spread my positivity. I go to San Jose, it's a whole different city, but I see the homeless people in the park. 
I spread my positivity. I walk through the park because I like, you know, seeing kids at the park. But um, we do got to know what's the right move instead of the wrong moves because the wrong moves are wrong moves and the right moves are the right moves. So I think if we do things right, it could go right way. So until there's the right solution, which is the solution, which is the best solution, that's the solution. So until then, we got to find what's the best solution. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Okay. Closing, well, closing public comment. I'm going to keep doing that now. Um, was there s someone on the count? Was just, I, I'm going to bring it back to council discussion because the public hearing for this was at the last meeting. We had lots of people commenting for and against, so this, this is not at all representative of what was here at the last meeting. Um, this item was just coming back to us for the uh, official uh, of the ordinance, but it's been pulled. So, Councilman Barmanderas, do you want to say anything before I ask I for? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. But I do think that this, uh, the comments tonight were representative. We had a good amount of folks advocating <coughs> against this ordinance. Um, but tonight, um, tonight I'm not going to try to appeal to uh, the humanity or kindness or a sense of equality of this council, but I am going to suggest that we um, be cautious in how we move forward. We've been warned about possible litigation and liability that we face, and also a number of downtown business owners are... Uh, really looked at the map and analyzed it and understand that the unforeseen circumstances or consequences of, of this ordinance could be that we're pushing our unhoused people downtown. We could be pushing them into residential areas, right? Given the map and the way it's laid out and the way this ordinance is written, that's essentially what we'll be doing because the sidewalks downtown could uh, are ADA compliant and people could fit there sitting, lying, or standing. So I want us to be cautious about that um, and I urge my colleagues to rethink this and vote now. Okay, thank you. If no one else is going to comment, I'm just going to say one thing and then I'll, I'll take a motion if no one else is commenting, but uh, just to speak to those who were here, this is not trying to control the number of people who live outdoors. This is not criminalizing homelessness. This is not about not wanting people to be. This is not about addressing homelessness at all. This is about addressing public safety. And so for those who were here at the last meeting and the one before that, it's public safety from actual events. That's what we're trying to do is to balance the aspect of all of the reports and complaints that we have been getting from issues that are near schools and children. This is not an effort to decide how or what should be for the homeless. And my report, I realized when I went and looked at the recording, was over eight minutes long trying to explain to people what those services are, where the monies come from from homelessness. This ordinance is about public safety, protecting public infrastructure, bridge supports, waterways that we drink, things like that. So whether or not we're successful is part two, but this is what this ordinance is about. It's not about addressing homelessness. Does anyone else want to make a comment or a motion? motion. Okay, motion by Councilmember Bracco. Second. And seconded by Councilmember Tovar to adopt, right, to adopt an ordinance of the City Council of City Gilroy adding Chapter 5 to the Gilroy City Code relating to banning the use of certain public rights away as sleeping or living accommodations. Councilmember Armadaris? No. Nope. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Klein? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. All right. That passed five to one with one absent. Okay. Agenda item 10, 10.1. Approve the purchase of three public works vehicles, one 2024 Ford F650 and rugby dump bed, one 2024 Ford F650 utility truck with hydraulic telescopic crane. And do I have to read all this? And 15 <laughs> air... No, okay. Leanne. <laughs> You're Can on. get the monitor back on here? Sure what happened. <clears throat> Didn't hit it hard enough. There it goes.
Okay, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council, Leanne McPhillips. Um, tonight we're asking you to approve the purchase of three vehicles for public works. Um, the City Council approved the replacement of these public works vehicles in the fiscal year 22 and 23 budget, and we're bringing it forward now to you at this time. Um, the three vehicles um, that we're looking to replace are based on the needs of the Public Works Department, um, are a Ford F-650 with a rugby dump bed, a uh, Ford F-650 utility truck with um, various features, and then a Ford F-750 water tank trunk with truck with a 1,500-gallon water tank. Um, we went through the formal uh, Public Works bidding process for these vehicles, given the cost associated with these particular vehicles. Um, so that was a process that we had to complete to bring these before you today. Uh, the first vehicle is a, a Ford F-650 uh, with a rugby dump bed. This replaces a 1989 freight liner junk truck. Uh, so you can see that we're replacing an aging vehicle um, that's having mechanical and physical part failures. Uh, we're also having some challenges um, because the vehicle doesn't um, comply with the Air Resources Board uh, emissions standards that we need to be meeting, so we're very limited on how we can utilize this vehicle. Um, so it needs to be replaced. Uh, we received one bid from TransWest Truck Center LLC in the amount of $110,625,000. And this um, vehicle that will be used mainly in the parks and landscape section, but all the vehicles are shared throughout Public Works and even across departments. So um, despite the, the main focus of the purchase of the vehicle, they can be used uh, across the organization as well as needed. Um, but this particular vehicle is mainly for parks and landscape. And uh, so we are recommending that we proceed forward uh, with the award of this bid to TransWest Truck Center. Uh, it complies with our purchasing policy requirements. Leanne, question? Sure. And I, I, I see we, ha we only had one bid for this. So these are more, I mean, obviously they're more specialized yes. trucks than what we sell locally. Correct. Right? Okay. And we, there weren't any tag-on bids right. that we could locate that would expedite the process, and so we had to put it out to public bid. And these are the um, this was, these were the only limited bids that we right. received. Um, they're not vehicles that you can just typically find at a dealership sitting right. on a dealership lot. They're highly specialized with special equipment for public works op operations. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next vehicle is a Ford F650 utility truck with a hydraulic telescopic crane and a hydraulic air compressor. Uh, this vehicle is uh, being designed to replace two utility trucks that we utilize now. Often we have to bring more than one vehicle to a particular job site, and this will condense that down to one particular vehicle that will have all the equipment and storage and supplies that we need to handle certain jobs um, in the water section. Uh, the utility trucks that we have now are experiencing metal fatigue and deterioration in the cargo areas. Also, the mobile crane and power lift uh, gate issues that we're experiencing with these vehicles have just been more frequent. Um, so the vehicles, these two older 2006 utility trucks are in the shop a lot. Uh, we did receive two bids, both from TransWest Truck Center. Uh, they provided bids to us in the form of option A and option B. Option A is the option that best meets the needs of the department and specifications, um, and that is in the amount of $276,500 because of the uh, specialty equipment that's associated with this particular vehicle. And in the Council's recommended actions, we are asking you to waive the requirement for a single bid submittal since there were no other bidders that came in for this particular vehicle. Uh, the third vehicle is a Ford F-750 water tank truck with a 1,500-gallon water tank. This replaces a 1994 international water truck. Um, again, we're experiencing mechanical and physical part failures with the 1994 vehicle. Uh, replacement parts are difficult to obtain. Uh, as with the other vehicle, we're having uh, difficulty uh, meeting the uh, Air Resources Board emission standards that we need to meet. Uh, we did get two bids for this particular vehicle, um, and we recommend awarding the low bid of $131,000 to TransWest Truck Center, LLC. This vehicle meets the department needs and the specifications that we put out in the bid process. So our recommendation is to move forward with the purchase of these three Public Works vehicles. We have funding in the fiscal year 23 budget in the fleet fund uh, set aside for these vehicles. The total combined cost of the three vehicles together is 518125 
Uh, we're asking for up to $15,000 uh, contingency uh, for any commodity surcharges or modifications. Sometimes we do experience situations where there's an uptick in some sort of steel surcharge or some sort of change, and so we want to make sure that we don't need to keep coming back to council if there's a small uh, adjustment that needs to be made. Uh, it's even with the full $15,000 uh, surcharge, if we, if we were to spend it, we're not planning to, but if we need to, um, it's still below the bid um, price of the second bidder for the third vehicle. Um, upon council approval, we'll finalize the purchase contracts to secure the order, and then we'll be finalizing the build and delivery of the vehicles. These will take some time to build and be delivered to the city, so the sooner we get the order in, the better off we are. So at this point, the council actions that we're um, putting before the council tonight is to, first off, waive the requirement for a single bid submittal from Transwest, Transwest Truck Center, LLC, for project number 23-PW-283. Um, that's because they did submit option A and option B. So we're going with option A because that most aligns with our needs and our uh, specifications. And then once that's... Uh, completed, we want to award the purchase of the three public works vehicles, as I described, and then approve the up to $15,000 contingency, and then authorize the city administrator to execute the purchase agreements and any related purchasing documents. Uh, with me here tonight is Abraham Carbonlino, our fleet superintendent. He did all the heavy lifting to get these three items before you tonight. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work to get all of the information about the vehicles, spec them out with the departments, make sure they're going to meet the department needs, uh, get the bid packet put together, put that all out, and that was on his plate to do, and um, so he did the heavy lifting there. And then Daryl Jordan, our public works director, is here, and he um, can also speak to the department's need for these vehicles, and we'd like to uh, bring this across the finish line. So happy to answer any questions, or I can bring staff up to assist. Thank, thank you, Leanne. All right, Council, uh, do you have any questions? Then I will just go to public comment. Do we have any public comment? No public comment, Madam Mayor. Okay, then looking for first a motion to waive the requirement for a single bid submittal. So no. moved. I'll second. Okay, moved by Council Member Tovar and seconded by uh, Council Member Klein. Do I need to do these separately? Yes. No, Madam Mayor. Nope. We can actually do this all in once. All in one? Oh. Yeah. You, could do all, you, could, you could do all four if you want. Okay. And do the two of you want to add and to award the purchase of the three vehicles, to approve up to 15000 as contingency, and to authorize the city administrator to execute the contracts? Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, I just want to make sure that um, the motion was made by Councilmember Tovar and seconded by Councilmember Klein? Yes. Okay. I'll open the vote. Mm. Thank you, everyone has voted. It has it. passed six to zero to zero to one absence. Got it. All right, thank you. Item 10.2, authorize the city to enter into a 10-year master services and purchasing agreement with Axon Enterprises to purchase the police officer safety and fleet bundle. Um, blah, blah, blah. Captain Roca, okay. No, Chief, mayor, and Captain uh, Roca. Members of council, I'm going to have Captain Rocha, Juan Rocha, present this. Okay. He's been a lead on the project, and this is an item and a budget request that was previously approved by council. And so he'll give you how we ultimately ended up here. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Good evening, Mayor, uh, council members, and members of the public. Tonight I'm presenting our request and need to upgrade some of our technology and associated equipment. Some of that equipment is our body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, and our uh, digital cloud-based storage capabilities. Um, I'll give you guys some background to start out. Um, so we've had in-car cameras and conducted energy weapons, more commonly known as tasers, um, since the early 2000s. Um, as far as body-worn cameras, I believe we were either the first or one of the very first agencies in the region to deploy them back in 2012. Um, and really, the use of the body-worn cameras as well as the in-car cameras are a best practice to promote accountability and transparency. Um, I remember when we first got these cameras, body-worn cameras back in 2012, it was um, just a weird thought about having a camera on your, on your chest recording everything. 
Uh, but we quickly realized the benefits of having these cameras, and now they're just they're, they're part of the uniform. They're, they're, our guys feel weird going out on patrol if they don't have uh, their cameras with them. And our goal has always uh, been to improve officer safety um, and internal and external transparency. So our current te technology, we currently have body-worn cameras and in-car cameras through WatchGuard, which we purchased back in 2016. Uh, both of these systems are as expected at the end of their technological life cycle, and they're failing quickly. Uh, the systems are no longer supported by the vendor, and replacements uh, for the, especially the body-worn cameras, are purchased on, on an as-needed basis. Um, on the same note, though, when we do need replacements, the, due to the lag in the supply chain, there's usually about an eight-month wait to get these replacements from the current vendor. Uh, currently, uh, for as far as tasers, we have the XP26 through Axon. Uh, we first purchased these in 2015. And back in 2015, when we got these tasers, it took about two years to transition the entire department uh, from the older version to the, uh, the X, XP26 tasers, which we currently have. Uh, we've always purchased uh, tasers from Axon, and they're currently being re replaced as needed. Uh, the, our current systems are uh, in-car cameras, body-worn cameras, along with tasers. They don't integrate. They don't talk to each other. Uh, video footage is currently stored in city servers that are maintained by the city's uh, IT department. And currently, uh, many times, video footage from either our body-worn cameras or our uh, in-car um, uh, in cameras are not uploading to the servers. So that requires one of two things. For body-worn cameras, we got to send it back to the vendor um, where they'll extract the data and they'll send it back to the city. Um, when it's the in-car camera, our IT staff has to physically track down the patrol vehicle, extract the, uh, the video footage, hand it over to the officer, which is then booked into um, our evidence. Um, and then as far as digital evidence, um, our current practice, which we're one of two departments remaining in the county um, that probably still do it the old way. Um, anytime there's a request uh, for video or um, photo evidence from the district attorney's office, our property evidence technician receives a request. She'll go and uh, track down the CD containing the footage. She'll make a copy of it, and then that copy eventually has to be driven to the district attorney's office. Um, as of last year, I spoke to our, um, our property and evidence technician. Last year, there were 1,300 requests from the DA's office that had to be downloaded on, onto a CD and driven up to the, um, the DA's office. Um, so then in 2021, we had a, a department team building workshop uh, with our supervisory group and our executive uh, command staff. And uh, a technology committee was formed to address some of these issues. Um, the committee has met over the last two years. Um, they've conducted research, cost and benefit analysis of different systems that are available. Uh, so then the committee identified Axon Enterprises as the ideal solution for the department uh, to upgrade our current body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, and evidence storage systems. Um, Axon is a sole source provider for their, um, for their cameras, um, in-car cameras, tasers, and their evidence.com system. Um, Axon does offer an uh, Officer Safety Plan 7 Premium and a Fleet 3 Advanced Bundle option, which I'll be covering in this presentation. Um, all the software and equipment offered in this package integrates with each other, so they talk to each other. And it also integrates with our uh, recently purchased uh, computer-aided dispatching and records management system, known as RIMS. Uh, the entire system is cloud-based. And Axon will replace uh, all equipment that mount functions or breaks. Uh, it would reduce the workload of our IT staff. Others no longer have to maintain any servers associated to this equipment. Uh, this right here is the Axon Body 3 camera that uh, is provided by Axon. Um, initially, um, at the beginning of the contract, they would outfit the entire department with uh, their own or staff with their own uh, body-worn camera, and then 
four additional times throughout the life of the contract, we would receive um, an entire new set of cameras for, for the entire department. All required training and installation of uploading charging equipment is provided by Axelon. And then also when we receive the, um, the upgraded body cameras, we'll receive their latest version. So if it's Axon Body 5, that's what we'll receive. So we'll receive new technology available at that time. Uh, this is their latest Taser. It's the Taser, uh, Taser 7. And again, they'll outfit the entire department uh, all at once. And then um, seven years into the contract, we would receive um, uh, new Tasers, uh, whether it's Taser 8 or Taser 9. Uh, whatever's available is what we'll receive. Um, all training and duty cartridges are provided on a yearly basis. And then training vouchers for our internal instructors, TASER instructors are provided so that they can turn around and train our entire department on a yearly basis. Uh, Fleet 3 is their in-car camera. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so initially they would uh, outfit our entire fleet with new cameras. And then again, twice, two additional times during the term of the contract, we would receive whatever version or the latest version available. Um, and they'll come out here and, and do the removal and do the reinstall of the new cameras. Um, the system does integrate with our flock, flock system, which is the automatic license plate reader uh, system that we have. And then evidence.com, that's their real, that's their cloud-based storage uh, system that they offer. The department would receive unlimited storage access to its cloud-based system, uh, which is evidence.com. All the video that we have in our current servers dating back to 2012, they will allow us to transfer all that footage over to the cloud-based system. Um, so those servers would no longer have to be maintained um, by our, our IT staff. Um, it would also allow the community to submit video and photo evidence via the citizen portal. And really, there's, uh, there's little chart of kind of the way it works, but uh, there's two ways of doing it. One is if we have a critical incident or an incident where we're asking the community for their assistance, uh, we would be able to send out a link via uh, social media and request that anyone that has any video or photographic evidence related to the incident in question that they click on the link and they'll be able to submit the um, potential evidence, which we'll then receive. Uh, we as a department can either accept the evidence or reject it if, it's has, if it's not relevant. Um, the other way is uh, it's more of an individual basis. It's usually when an officer goes out to a call for service, they break into a business and they have some kind of camera system, but you know, they, the, either the worker or the owner doesn't really know how to work the system, so they can't download the video uh, or the video evidence at that time. Normally what happens is they'll call us back when the video is ready, we'll drive out there, um, we'll collect it, we'll drive it back to the station, and we'll book it into evidence. With this, we can just shoot them a direct link to them. Once they have the video footage, they'll upload it through, through this link. <clears throat> and then it'll also allow us for uh, sharing of digital evidence with other government agencies like the district attorney's office. Um, Axon Virtual Reality, it's a uh, use of force, decision making, and de-escalation uh, scenario based virtual reality uh, training tool. It allows officers to build critical thinking skills by progressing through increasingly complex scenarios. And um, so we would get the initial um, VR set and then three additional times throughout the uh, life of the contract. And the photo on top, it's, it's just a photo of an officer wearing the equipment going through some scenarios. And then the photo at the bottom is uh, kind of what it looks like, or what the officer sees through the, uh, through the VR system. And then, so this package comes with a lot of different um, applications or capabilities, but I'll highlight some of the most significant ones. And Axon Signal is a, a pretty important one for us. Um, it allows for the body cameras and in-car cameras to um, automatically activate through a wireless signal. And this is pretty important when an officer is confronted with a pretty stressful incident. Uh, the last thing we want is for him to have to worry about manually activating uh, his, his or her's camera. Um, so this would activate the camera through either unholstering of a firearm, unholstering of a taser, the activation of emergency lights. Um, 
The next one would be the Axon Respond. Um, that allows officers to view real time and live footage from an officer's um, activated body worn camera and determine their location during critical incidents such as active shooters or officer involved incidents. Um, Axon View and Capture. Um, this will allow officers to simply uh, use their department issued smartphones, take photo, uh, photos of evidence. Would you like questions when you're done or as you go? I'm um, good either way. Go ahead, Council Member Armanderas. Um, thank you, officer. For, does Axon, so for example, when it automatically activates the body worn cameras, um, you said either, is, does that include all three of those different options or one of those? All three options. All three. Yes. And does it automatically upload to the cloud? Uh, when when, you, it turns when on? you drive back to the station, it'll just it'll out, uh, upload automatically. Yes. Once you're back at the station. Correct. Okay. And then, let's see. And the district attorney has access to our. Will have access to our evidence.com account. They would. They would only have access to specific cases that they're. They'll submit a request for a case, and we'll grant them access to that case. Okay. And then with uh, Public Records Act requests, um, how, are, how do those interface with the department and the public and evidence.com? Um, so if, 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 it, if we get a PRA request where um, we have to release certain information, then if we have it available, then it would be releasable. Um, it does have an option. Uh, uh, for the Axon redaction, uh, one of the last bullet points is um, it will automatically redact videos from the footage, uh, faces, license plates. Um, it will do it on its own um, so we don't have to have either staff or, or, or contract a third-party vendor. Okay. Um, so a couple slides back it talked about public access to yes. uh, just for uploading. Correct. Right? Okay. So they can share evidence or digital evidence with us. Okay. And well, last question <laughs> so far. Um, are there other agencies, federal or state or local, that will have access to our evidence.com account? Um, again, it's, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, yes, I mean, anyone, uh, government, any other government agency could have access to specific cases. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How many more slides do you have? Uh, just a couple more. Okay. That's the last one. Okay. Uh, so after evaluating our contract options, we believe we would greatly benefit uh, from cost savings and from a technology aspect by agreeing to a 10-year contract. Uh, technology is evolving at a pace nearly impossible to keep up with. Uh, the 10-year contract will ensure we have modern, te uh, modern day technology that will increase the safety of our officers and our transparency efforts with the community. We acknowledge that this request is a huge Financial commitment, however, approval of the 10-year contract will allow us to plan financially for the future and will be able to avoid any future unexpected financial costs. This is why we recommend the City Council to authorize the City to enter into a 10-year master services and purchasing agreement with Axon Enterprises to purchase the police officer's safety and fleet bundle to include body-worn cameras, conducted energy weapons, tasers, in-car camera system and digital evidence storage for three million seven hundred ninety-one thousand two hundred ninety dollars for ten years. For ten years. Okay. And with that, I'll take any other additional questions. Thank you. Okay, council members, do you have any other questions? Okay, council member Bracco. Yes. Uh, do you believe that this is gonna um, get rid of the issue where sometimes officers forget to turn their cameras on? I believe it will greatly reduce it. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I'm sure there's instances where it might not activate automatically, right? Um, you know, officer could be sitting doing something in their car and they get attacked and no lights are turned on, their weapon's not on holster, so that camera, camera's not going to activate. But it's going to help. It, it'll greatly, yes, it'll greatly help. Thank you. It's also going to help in terms of just product, uh, you know, items that you need that are hard to get. It, it kind of helps in the overall. Correct. Of things with that. Yes, correct. So I mean, uh, again, uh, if something breaks, send it back. The overnight is uh, the new one. Councilmember Tovar. 
And then just saying, I stand on the same question. So it's great that they would replace anything that um, breaks or, you know. Um, is that throughout the duration of the, of, the, of the time, or is that after seven years, or how does? Uh, so you get the, ref right. call it a refresher, the new right. advanced technology, um, when it's uh, as agreed upon. But anything that malfunctions or breaks, it's just through the, through the 10-year contract. Right, because when you mention, like, Taser 7, wherever that's, mm -hmm. and, you know, Every year things change, obviously. You know, in two right. years it'd be Taser 20, right? Exactly. Um, would they upgrade those for us every time they, there's a new upgrade? So when we get the refresher, for, let's just say yeah. Taser, well, currently it's Taser 7. When we get an upgrade, it's seven, year, uh, seven years into the contract for Taser. If there's a Taser 11, then that's what we'll get. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any public comment, but I have to ask. Yes, Madam Mayor. No public comment. Okay. I move for approval. Closing public comment, um, moved by Councilmember Tovar and seconded by Councilmember Bracco. Yeah, I'm clarifying that that is the motion and second. We are voting on A and B, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Comments? Yes. Motion passes to 6001 with okay. one absent. Great. Uh, item 11 is public hearings. We have none. Item 12, unfinished business, none. Item 13, new business, 13.1. Okay, we're, this is South County Youth Task Force report, and my understanding, um, Chief, whether it's you or Sandra or together, it's going to be a single report by staff for 13.1, 2, 3, and 4. Yes, that's okay. correct, Madam Mayor. All right, and then we can uh, ask questions or whatever we want. Okay. Madam Mayor, I'm going to have uh, our South Dakota Youth Task Force Coordinator, Sandra Cruz, present this. And really, this is a follow-up of the presentation we provided uh, in January relating to the strategic goals of the task force. And really, this is funding that we receive to carry out those goals. And instead of having that in consent calendar, this is an opportunity for council to understand where these funds are going to. Beautiful. So Thank you. So I will you. invite Sandra Cruz up here. Okay. Thank you, Chief Espinoza. Good evening, Mayor Blankley, members of the Gilroy City Council, and members of the public. My name is Sandra Cruz, and I am the South County Task Force Coordinator for the City of Gilroy, and I am here tonight to present on agenda items number 13.1, 13.2, 13.3, and 13.4, collectively as they pertain to the South County Youth Task Force's work. As you may recall, I came previously to present on two occasions during the last few months, the first time in December 12, 2022, and where you all accepted the grant funds for the South County Youth Task Force Restorative Justice Youth Diversion Program for a total of $1 million that the South County Youth Task Force secured through competitive state funding. Out of 45 applicants statewide, our application was ranked number three, in where the top 10 applicants were awarded funding. And most recently on January 23 of this year, in where the city, uh, or when, in where the task force program manager, Bernice Aguilera Tony, and I presented to you on our 2023 2026 strategic plan titled Project to Thrive. Tonight, I am here to request that you accept the county funding that helps further our mission through our strategic goals that were identified by the South County community. One of our strategic goals from our current plan is to continue the work in East Gilroy that the South County Youth Task Force began in 2012. In 2012, the South County Youth Task Force began work, began working with the Public Health Department to start activating San Ysidro Park. And in 2017, the NSU funding came as a way to bridge the CalGrip funding that was ending at that time. Through this funding, we work with resident leaders, we work to offer classes, we work to provide leadership development, and we work to positively act, activate San Ysidro Park. Today, we are requesting that you accept the renewal of the NSU agreement 
and once again to support youth and families who reside in East Gilroy per strategic plan for a total of $142,550 for fiscal year 24. Additionally, we are requesting that you accept $331,406 from the District Attorney's Office to help us continue to provide crucial services for the most vulnerable youth in the community, both for a total of $473,956 to help pay for direct services and programs. These funds uh, don't include in-kind um, positions that the county assigns to the South County Youth Task Force. Uh, to help meet our mission and our strategic goals. These, uh, this funding will help us meet our first strategic goals from our new strategic plan, um, which are after school opportunities and safe places for youth, support for youth through local education systems, and community engagement, engagement and safety. And I encourage all of you to please visit our website and download a digital copy of our strategic plan and to also learn more about uh, upcoming services and programs that the South Canadian Task Force uh, has. These are a few current services offered uh, in Gilroy that these funds will pay for. Late night gyms, intervention support, family and engagement crisis, contracted by a local community-based agency empowering our community for success, cultural and character development programs, youth interventions, case management, youth outreach, school-based restorative justice circles through community solutions, San Ysidro Park neighborhood activation, summer flag football and other pro-social activities, and positive school climate support for schools and also in the community. Now, I would like to highlight that community solutions has been involved with the South Canadian Youth Task Force since 2012, and they have actively collaborated uh, with our work through committees and leveraging other services and, their fun and other fundings. Their contracted uh, youth services were most critical during COVID-19 and even so now, post-COVID. They continue to operate without pausing services and ensuring that the most vulnerable youth receive the support they needed. When we first contracted with Community Solutions back in 2020, uh, we released a request for quotes and shared them with over 50 or with over 20 community-based agencies to encourage them to apply in South County and in Santa Clara County. Part of tonight's request is to ask for your approval of a third amendment that extends their services through June 30, 2024. This third amendment covers services retroactively for three years and is also paid through and it's all paid through the South County Task Force grants. These are addition, these are other services that these funds will also pay for Chinachi Growth Rites of Passage, Truancy Abatement, DA Mediation, SARP Support, Summer Scholarships for Local Youth, Intensive Case Management, Evening Pro Social Activities, uh, through the Youth Alliance, training uh, for community. Uh, and partners such as Parent Project, Restorative Justice uh, Practices, support with community and relationship building events, and also for the South County Restorative Justice Youth Diversion Program. This concludes my presentation, and um, if you, I'm, I can answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Mayor, you're going to call, and you want me just to ask? Yeah. No, I would like to call. Yeah, so I see Councilmember Marks here. Okay. And then Councilmember Armendariz. All right. Thank you for your report, Sandra. Um, how many youth participate in these programs overall, would you say? Since the, ta the South County Youth Task Force began in uh, 2012, we've served over more than 10,000 youth and duplicated. So these are services, these are youth that participate in ongoing case management, in workshops, and then we annually host events mm -hmm. where we uh, reach about 500 uh, youth and families per event, so it's it's hard to um, say a number mm -hmm. um, at the at, at the moment. All right. Um, do you ever collect data to see if it's really making a difference with families and the success stories? 
Absolutely. Um, with the Title II funding uh, that we just received, we have to work with the third-party evaluator mm -hmm. that um, really analyzes the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we also have, so we'll, we'll be able to report and come back to all of you, and that will go to the state as well to determine how effective our restorative mm -hmm. justice youth diversion program was. Mm -hmm. And we also had one with the CalVIP um, funding back in uh, 2020, and that report is public. And we also do um, surveys for youth, for parents, and for providers that really engage in letting us know how the services are going, uh, any recommendations, and really um, tracks um, information about how the services are going. Okay, great, because I know for me, that's what I would like to see, the success, and you know, celebrate that, and, and know that the money's really doing something. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Councilmember Armendaris. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for your work on this. this is, um, I read through the grant. It looks incredible, and the amount of work and the amount of youth that uh, you've reached and will be reached to also seems um, like it makes changes, right? It really impacts uh, young people, their families, and our community. Um, I do have questions. Is empowering our community for success, is that still like a religious-based organization, or is that – or am I mistaken in that? Empowering Our Community for Success is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit. So the services that they're contracted to do are late night gyms every Thursday night at a ruler. They come and do, and um, they do sports. So they coordinate sports, they organize a dinner, and they um, do different arts and crafts. So it, it is not a religious okay. um, agency. Thank you. And then I saw that there was some neighborhood engagement. Um, or an item about neighborhood engagement, engaging the neighbors. But I don't see Nueva Vida on there. I know they're really active at, at San Ysidro. Will they be So the contracted? Neighborhood Safety Services Unit the, the, uh, from probation does um, support work in East Gilroy. So uh, San Ysidro Nueva Vida is a resident uh, group that we do work with in the, in the community. But they'll be... NSS is a is a probation department. NSU is the NSU. is the unit that provides the funding through the probation department uh, that supports the work out in East Gilroy. So yes, th that's one of the groups that we work with. But we work with all uh, partners in the community, and we uh, encourage that um, those that want to be involved in in the work uh, do you know are involved. Okay, but no specific contract with Nueva Vida. We do not have a specific contract with Nueva Vida. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And Sandra, thank you. Great, great presentation, obviously. I know I'm supposed to be somewhere in there, but I think that was on Zoom, so anyhow. But <laughs> you, you <laughs> um, I'm there. just looking at, again, a, a similar question in regards to the wonderful services that you guys provide. And I'm looking at, you know, sort of the mentorship, the counseling, the job training type thing, and I think Council Member Marks mentioned that. When it comes to, like, career planning and job training, do we have stats on, like, how many – of these individuals end up getting a job that we that the, that the organization helps them with. Not specific to yeah. how many youth do um, get a job right. or are, enter the workforce, but we do have uh, the case managers support with youth if they're not doing well academically. They have goal settings, they have career settings, and uh, they do annual goals with the youth. So we do support them in, in um, getting back on track with their school, getting a job. We connect them with other agencies or with uh, private businesses that um, they could learn from and really advance in that way. Right. In addition to that, when you look at, I mean, just look at the list of the things that you're doing, uh, field trips, are those, does that include, like, visiting colleges, um, job, you know, job training places? Um, yes. I will go back yeah. to one of the pictures that we have up here. The picture on the top um, is from a uh, recent trip that we took. We took about 50 youth to UC Berkeley, and this was paid um, out of a, a grant that um, – our probation um, partner uh, applied to. So we were able to take 50 youth up to Berkeley. They received a orientation and a tour uh, by other youth that looked like them, and they really supported them in that career pathway, uh, shared their journeys, and really encouraged them to see themselves there one day. Right. So that's something that we do do, and we encourage. We take youth out of the community so that they could really see what is out there. Uh, the majority of them had never visited 
um, Berkeley and wow. is just in our area. So we really want to uh, encourage them to see themselves there and really use our personal stories to encourage them and motivate them and okay. really let them know that they can. I'm also from Gilroy. I moved to Gilroy and I'm seven years old and I was very fortunate to be able to go to Berkeley. So just encouraging them and using my story and my voice um, really supports the youth and seeing themselves there um, and really motivates them to, to, to do the best that they can because they could all uh, attend Berkeley if they right. wanted to and, and other colleges that are nearby. And you probably already do this last question. In regards not only with colleges but, you know, trade schools obviously and then hearing some of the speakers over the last few weeks uh, from the – the labor groups or the unions saying, you know, building that partnership, maybe this is a, a way of, um, you know, encouraging a lot of these students to go into a trade. Absolutely. When we uh, did our strategic plan and we hosted many community listening circles, that was one of the things that the youth and the families shared, that they wanted to see more of that. Yeah. So we do have a committee that um, will be supporting uh, meeting that goal in the next three years and really connecting and uh, encouraging and making that linkage. We have Gavlin College here in the community, and they also offer trade. So really linking and supporting youth to know where they could go and get services and uh, get the information that they need. Real quick, and great job, by the way. Um, you said here, in-kind county positions, it does not include that. So what, are, what, what does that mean? What, Absolutely. What are so uh, these are uh, funding contributions that go directly to services. We um, contract with community-based agencies to deliver these services. And this, this contribution does not include uh, the staff that the county um, assigns to the South County Task Force to provide services. We have a program manager that supports this work, Bernice. We have a deputy district attorney that also supports our work. And we have an um, a proba educational probation officer that uh, is focused on outreach, that is focused on supporting the youth. So n all those positions are not... Uh, reflective of this amount that the that we're receiving from the county, but it goes a long way to helping. You. Absolutely, yeah, and that's Absolutely. great. That's that's great. Yeah. So, being one of the representatives with Councilmember Tover on this, this is a wonderful collaborative effort. I think everybody should know between the DA's office, law enforcement, our school districts, um, our our city councils, our supervisor. I mean, it really is. And at the last meeting, which is where that last picture was taken, I'd say we pretty darn well perfected the strategic plan. I mean, we went through each one of those things and, and by item by item. So um, very well done. Thank you. If there are no other questions from council, I'd like to... Uh, Ask if we have any public comment. I don't see any speakers here, so I'm going to assume that we do not. I'll move for approval. Second. Okay, Hank, what are we moving approval for? And let me give well, Ty a chance to confirm that there's no one from the public who wants to speak sorry. because we have one, two, three, and four. We'll take them each separately, I think. Yes. Okay. You want to do? Okay. So yeah. the, the motion confirming that there's no public comment, is that correct? Yes, Madam Mayor, we did not I do not have any public comments for okay. any of these items. So the motion was made by Councilmember Tovar, right? Yes. And seconded by Me. by Councilmember Marks for 13.1, which well that's to receive reports. So then for 13.2, which is to ratify the first and second amendments to the agreement with Community Solutions. And does that have to be separate from the second one? Yes, Madam okay, Mayor. Okay, then let's do that one first. The motion to approve. It's we have a we have a motion and a second already. We need to vote. Yeah. I thought it was okay. We're voting on on item one thirteen point two. Correct. The first part. And motion the motion was done by Councilmember Tovar, seconded by Councilmember Almedares. Correct. No, no seconded Marks. by Councilmember Marks. Marks. Oh, okay. Digital vote is now open. Okay. <laughs> okay, and that passes. Um, six. It's unanimous, but for the one absent. Okay, now I need a motion to approve the third amendment to the so, agreement. So motion. Made by Council Member Mark, seconded by Council Member Klein. My system is not cooperating, so I will just go ahead and just do the roll call on this one. Okay. So, motion by Council Member Marks. Marks. And seconded by Council Member Klein. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Amadeus? 
Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Klein? Yes. Councilmember Hilton yes. is absent. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Also unanimous, but for the one absent. And then on 13.4, I need a motion to approve an amendment to the service agreement with the County of Santa Clara Probation Department for South County Youth Task Force Violence Prevention Programs and authorize. So moved. Oh, I thought sorry, did I miss yeah. one? We still have C. We, no, okay, 13. I thought we did that, that, right. and this. Okay. Ty, where, what do you sh show that we need? Uh, let me make sure here, Madam Mayor. Uh, Start 13, with 13.2. With 13.2, we just um, the council just voted on the approval of the third amendment to the agreement with Community Solutions for a total not to exceed amount of right. And we did the first and second amendment. Correct. Do and we also need to authorize the city administrator to execute? That was also I, part of the motion. That's what I thought. So it was part of it. Right. So yeah. we got that. And then did we not just do? 13.3. No. 3. 13.3. No. No, no, we have not. That's where we're at. Okay, currently. so 13.3. Need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Councilmember Armendariz, seconded by Councilmember Tovar. Give me one second, mm -hmm. Madam Mayor. Making sure what that is. Motion to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy approving a budget amendment in fiscal years 23-24, adding an additional $331,406 in expenditures and offsetting revenue from the County of Santa Clara District Attorney's Office to the South County Youth Task Force Fund 227. Councilmember Medeiros? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Klein? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Unanimous uh, with one absent. Okay, so the 13.4 is the motion to approve an amendment to the service agreement with the County of Santa Clara Probation Department for South County Task Force Violence Prevention Programs. A motion. Okay. Second. Made by Councilmember Klein and Second. seconded by Councilmember Marks. Okay, and authorize the city administrator to execute the amendment to the service agreement and related documents. I just finished reading it. This is all, all one motion. All one motion. Okay, and that uh, unanimous with one absent. Okay, city administrator's reports. No okay. report. And city attorney's reports. No report. Then um, in celebration of Juneteenth, I'd like to uh, say, on June 19th, 1865, more than two years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved Americans in Galveston, Texas, finally received word that they were free from slavery and captivity free for the first time and recognized as citizens, blank, black Americans came to commemorate Juneteenth with celebrations across the country, building new lives and a new tradition that we honor today. While Juneteenth is a reminder of the profound impact slavery had on our nation, it also reminds us of our capacity to heal, grow, and emerge from our darkest moments with purpose and resolve. May we rise above adversity, unite in our pursuit of justice, and continue to shape a future that embodies the principles of freedom, dignity, and equality for every individual. I adjourn this council meeting in celebration of Juneteenth. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a good trip, Marie. <laughs> Thank you.